31. Terminal Velocity Commander Norton had never yet lost a man, and he had no intention of losing one now. Even before Jimmy had set off for the South Pole, he had been considering ways of rescuing him in the event of accident. The problem had turned out to be so difficult, however, that he had found no answer. All that he had managed to do was to eliminate every obvious solution. How does one climb a half-kilometer vertical cliff, even in reduced gravity? With the right equipment and training, it would be easy enough. But there were no Python guns aboard Endeavor, and no one could think of any other practical way of driving the necessary hundreds of spikes into that hard mirror surface. He had glanced briefly at more exotic solutions, some, frankly, crazy. Perhaps a simp, fitted with suction pads, could make the ascent. But even if this scheme was practical, how long would it take to manufacture and test such equipment, and to train a simp to use it? He doubted if a man would have the necessary strength to perform the feat. Then there was more advanced technology. The EVA propulsion units were tempting, but their thrust was too small, since they were designed for zero-G operation. They could not possibly lift the weight of a man, even against Rama's modest gravity. Could an EVA thruster be sent up on automatic control, carrying only a rescue line? He had tried out this idea on Sergeant Myron, who had promptly shot it down. There were the engineer pointed out, severe stability problems. They might be solved, but it would take a long time, much longer than they could afford. What about balloons? There seemed a faint possibility here, if they could devise an envelope and a sufficiently compact source of heat. This was the only approach that Norton had not dismissed when the problem suddenly ceased to be one of theory and became a matter of life and death, dominating the news in all the inhabited worlds. While Jimmy was making his trek along the edge of the sea, half the crackpots in the solar system were trying to save him. At fleet headquarters, all the suggestions were considered, and about one in a thousand was forwarded to Endeavor. Dr. Carlisle Pereira's arrived Time twice, get the job done. once via the survey's own network, and once by Planetcom, Rama Priority. It had taken the scientist approximately five minutes of thought, and one millisecond of computer time. At first, Norton thought it was a joke in very poor taste. Then he saw the sender's name and the attached calculations, and did a quick double-take. He handed the message to Carl Mercer. "'What do you think of this?' he asked, in as non-committal a tone of voice as he could manage. Carl read it swiftly, then said, "'Well, I'm damned. He's right, of course.' "'Are you sure? He was right about the storm, wasn't he? We should have thought of this. It makes me feel a fool. You have company. The next problem is, how do we break it to Jimmy?' I don't think we should, until the last possible minute. That's how I'd prefer it if I was in his place. Just tell him we're on the way. Though he could look across the full width of the cylindrical sea and knew the general direction from which resolution was coming, Jimmy did not spot the tiny craft until it had already passed New York. It seemed Go incredible that it could carry six men, and whatever equipment they had brought to rescue him. When it was only a kilometer away, right, he recognized Commander Norton right. and started waving. A little later, the skipper spotted him and waved back. Turn Glad right. to see you're in good shape, Jimmy, he radioed. I promised we wouldn't leave you behind. Now do you believe me? Not quite, Jimmy thought. Until this moment, he had still wondered if this was all a kindly plot to keep up his morale. But the commander would not have crossed the sea Get just to say goodbye. To 
he must have worked out something. I'll believe you, Skipper, he said, when I'm down there on the deck. Now will you tell me how I'm going to make it? Resolution was slowing down a hundred meters from the base of the cliff. As far as Jimmy could tell, she carried no unusual equipment, though he was not sure what he had expected to see. Turn left. Sorry about that, Jimmy, but we didn't want you to have too many things to worry about. Now, that sounded ominous. What the devil did he mean? Resolution came to a halt, 50 meters out and 500 below. Jimmy had almost a bird's eye view of the commander as he spoke into his microphone. This is it, Jimmy. You'll be perfectly safe, but it will require nerve. It's a nice ride. We know you've got plenty of that. You're going to jump. Five hundred meters? Yes, but at only half a G. So? Have you ever fallen two hundred and fifty on Earth? Shut up or I'll cancel your next leave. You should have worked this out for yourself. It's just a question of terminal velocity. In this atmosphere, you can't reach more than 90 kilometers an hour, whether you fall 200 or 2,000 meters. 90 is a little high for comfort, but we can trim it some more. This is what you'll have to do, so listen carefully. I will, said Jimmy. It had better be good. He did not interrupt the commander again, and made no comment when Norton had finished. Yes, it made sense and was so absurdly simple that it would take a genius to think of it, and, perhaps, someone who did not expect to do it himself. Jimmy had never tried high-diving, or made a delayed parachute drop, which would have given him some psychological preparation for this feat. One could tell a man that it was perfectly safe to walk a plank across an abyss, yet even if the structural calculations were impeccable, he might still be unable to do it. Now, Jimmy understood why the commander had been so evasive about the details of the rescue. He had been given no time to brood or to think of objections. I don't want to hurry you, said Norton's persuasive voice from half a kilometer below. But the sooner the better. Jimmy looked at his precious souvenir the only flower in Rama. He wrapped it carefully in his grimy handkerchief, knotted the fabric, and tossed it over the edge of the cliff. It fluttered down with reassuring slowness, but it also took a very long time, getting smaller and smaller and smaller, until he could no longer Get see it. To turn right. But then resolution surged forward, turn and he right. knew that it had been spotted. Beautiful, exclaimed the commander enthusiastically. I'm sure they'll name it after you. Okay, we're waiting. Jimmy stripped off his shirt, the Get only upper garment anyone ever wore in this turn now that. tropical climate, and stretched it thoughtfully. Several times on his trek, he had almost discarded it. Now, Get it might help to, to save right. his life. For the turn last time... Right. He looked back at the hollow world he alone had explored, and the distant, ominous pinnacles of the big and little horns. Then, grasping the shirt firmly with his right hand, he took a running jump as far out over the cliff as he could. Now, there was no particular hurry. He had a full twenty seconds in which to enjoy the experience. But he did not waste any time, as the wind strengthened around him, and resolution slowly expanded in his field of view. Holding his shirt with both hands, he stretched his arms above his head, so that the rushing air filled the garment and blew it into a hollow tube. As Keep a parachute, and then it was hardly up. a success. The few kilometers an hour it subtracted from his speed were useful, but not vital. It was doing a much more important job, keeping his body vertical, so that he would arrow straight into the sea. He still had the impression that he was not moving at all, but that the water below was rushing up toward him. 
Once he had committed himself, he had no sense of fear. Indeed, he felt a certain indignation against the skipper for keeping him in the dark. Did he really think that he would have been scared to jump if he'd had to brood over it too long? At the last moment, he let go of his shirt, took a deep breath, and grabbed his mouth and nose with his hands. As he had been instructed, he stiffened his body into a rigid bar and locked his feet together. He would enter the water as cleanly as a falling spear. It will be just the same, the commander had promised, as stepping off a diving board on earth. Nothing to it, if you make a good entry. And if I don't? he had asked. Then you'll have to go back and try again. Something slapped him across the feet. Keep right, Hard, but and then not turn viciously. Right. A million slimy hands were tearing at his body. There was a roaring in his ears, a mounting pressure, and even though his eyes were tightly closed, he could tell that darkness was falling as he arrowed down into the depths of the cylindrical sea. With all his strength, he started to swim upward toward the fading light. He could not open his eyes for more than a single blink. The poisonous water felt like acid when he did so. He seemed to have been struggling for ages, and more than once he had a nightmare fear that he had lost his orientation and was really swimming downward. Then he would risk another quick glimpse, and every time the light was stronger. His eyes were still clenched tightly shut when he broke water. He gulped a precious mouthful of air, rolled over on his back, and looked around. Resolution was heading toward him at top speed. Within seconds, eager hands had grabbed him and dragged him aboard. Did you swallow any water? was the commander's anxious question. I don't think so. Rinse your mouth out with this anyway. That's fine. How do you feel? I'm not really sure. I'll let you know in a minute. Oh, thanks, everybody. The minute was barely up when Jimmy was only too sure how he felt. I'm going to be sick, he confessed miserably. His rescuers were incredulous. In a dead calm, on a flat sea, protested Sergeant Barnes, who seemed to regard Jimmy's plight as a direct reflection on her skill. Oh, I'd hardly call it flat, said the commander, waving his arm around at the band of water that circled the sky. But don't be ashamed. You may have swallowed some of that stuff. Get rid of it as quickly as you can. Jimmy was still straining, unheroically and unsuccessfully, when there was a flicker of light in the sky behind them. All eyes turned toward the South Pole, and Jimmy instantly forgot his sickness. The horns had started their fireworks display again. There were the kilometer-long streamers of fire, dancing from the central spike to its smaller companions. Once again they began their stately rotation, as if invisible dancers were winding their ribbons around an electric maypole. But now they began to accelerate, moving faster and faster, until they blurred into a flickering cone of light. It was a spectacle more awe-inspiring than any they had yet seen here, and it brought with it a distant crackling roar, which added to the impression of overwhelming power. The display lasted for about five minutes, then it stopped, as abruptly as if someone had turned a switch. Oh, I'd like to know what the Rama Committee make of that, Norton muttered to no one in particular. Has anyone here got any theories? There was no time for an answer, because at that moment, hub control called in great excitement. Resolution, are you okay? Did you feel that? Feel what? We think it was an earthquake. It must have happened the minute those fireworks stopped. Any damage? I don't think so. It wasn't really violent, but it shook us up a bit. We felt nothing at all, but we wouldn't out here in the sea. Of course, silly of me. 
Anyway, everything seems quiet now. Until next time. Yes, until next time, Norton echoed. The mystery of Rama was steadily growing. The more they discovered about it, the less they understood. There was a sudden shout from the helm. Skipper, look, up there in the sky. Norton lifted his eyes and swiftly scanned the circuit of the sea. He saw nothing until his gaze had almost reached the zenith and he was staring at the other side of the world. My God, he whispered slowly as he realized that the next time was already almost here. A tidal wave was racing toward them down the eternal curve of the cylindrical sea. 32. The Wave Even in that moment of shock, Norton's first concern was for his ship. Endeavor, he called. Situation report? All okay, Skipper, was the reassuring answer from Exec. We felt a slight tremor, but nothing that could cause any damage. There's been a small change of attitude... The bridge says about 0.2 degrees. They also think the spin rate has altered slightly. We'll have an accurate reading on that in a couple of minutes. So it's beginning to happen, Norton said Keep to right, himself. And then turn right. And a lot earlier than we expected. We're still a long way from perihelion and the logical time for an orbit turn change. Right. But some kind of trim was undoubtedly taking place. And there might be more shocks to come. Meanwhile, the effects of this first one were all too obvious. Up there on the curving sheet of water that seemed perpetually falling from the sky. The wave was about ten kilometers away and stretched the Keep full left. width of the sea from northern to southern shore. Near the land, it was a foaming wall of white, but in deeper water, it was a barely visible blue line moving much faster than the breakers on either flank. The drag of the shoreward shallows was already bending it into a bow, with the central portion getting farther and farther ahead. Sergeant, said Norton urgently, this is Keep your left. job. And then continue what can we do? Straight on. Sergeant Barnes had brought the raft completely to rest and was Go studying the situation on. intently. Her expression, Norton was relieved to see showed no trace of alarm. Rather, a certain zestful excitement, like that of a skilled athlete about to accept a challenge. I wish we had some soundings, she said. If we're in deep water, there's nothing to worry about. Then we're all right. We're about four kilometers from shore. I hope so, but I want to study the situation. She applied power again and swung resolution around until it was just underway, heading directly toward the approaching wave. Norton judged that the swiftly moving central portion would reach them in less than five minutes, but he could also see that it presented no serious danger. It was only a racing ripple a fraction of a meter high and would scarcely rock the boat. The walls of foam lagging far behind it were the real menace. Suddenly, in the very center of the sea, a line of breakers appeared. The wave had clearly hit a submerged wall several kilometers in length, not far below the surface. At the same time, the breakers on the two flanks collapsed as they ran into deeper water. Anti-slosh plates, Norton told himself. Exactly the same as in Endeavour's own propellant tanks, but on a thousand-fold greater scale. There must be a complex pattern of them all around the sea to damp out any waves as quickly as possible. The only thing that matters now is, are we right on top of one? Sergeant Barnes was one jump ahead of him. She brought resolution to a full stop and threw out the anchor. It hit bottom at only five meters. Haul it up, she called to her crewmates. We've got to get away from here. Norton agreed heartily. But in which direction? The sergeant was headed full speed toward the wave, 
which was now only five kilometers away. For the first time, he could hear the sound of its approach, a distant, unmistakable roar, which he had never expected to hear inside Rama. Then it changed in intensity. The central portion was collapsing again, and the flanks again were building up. He tried to estimate the distance between the submerged baffles, assuming that they were spaced at equal intervals. If he was right, there should be one more to come. If they could station the raft in the deep water between them, they would be perfectly safe. Sergeant Barnes cut the motor and threw out the anchor again. It went down 30 meters without hitting bottom. We're okay, she said with a sigh of relief but I'll keep the motor running. Now, there were only the lagging walls of foam along the coast. Out here in the central sea, it was calm again, apart from the inconspicuous blue ripple still speeding to them. The sergeant was just holding resolution on course toward the disturbance, ready to pour on full power at a moment's notice. Then, only two kilometers ahead of them, the sea started to foam once more. It humped up in white-maned fury, and now its roaring seemed to fill the world. Upon the 16-kilometer high wave of the cylindrical sea, a smaller ripple was superimposed, like an avalanche thundering down a mountain slope. And that ripple was quite large enough to kill them. Sergeant Barnes must have seen the expressions on the faces of her crewmates. She shouted above the roar, What are you scared about? I've ridden bigger ones than this. That was not quite true, nor did she add that her earlier experience had been in a well-built surf boat, not an improvised raft. But if we have to jump, wait until I tell you. Check your life jackets. She's magnificent like a Viking warrior going into battle and obviously enjoying every minute, thought the commander. And she's probably right, unless we've miscalculated badly. The wave continued to rise, curving upward and over. The slope above them probably exaggerated its height, but it looked enormous, an irresistible force of nature that would overwhelm everything in its path. Then, within seconds, it collapsed, as if its foundations had been pulled out from underneath it. It was over the submerged barrier, in deep water again. When it reached them a minute later, resolution merely bounced up and down a few times before Sergeant Barnes swung her around and set off at top speed toward the north. Thanks, Ruby. That was splendid. But will we get home before it comes around for the second time? Probably not. It will be back in about 20 minutes. But it will have lost all its strength then. We'll scarcely notice it. Now that the wave had passed, they could relax and enjoy the voyage. Though no one would be completely at ease until they were back on land. The disturbance had left the water swirling in random eddies and had also stirred up a most peculiar acidic smell, like crushed ants, as Jimmy put it well. Though unpleasant, the odor caused none of the attacks of seasickness that might have been expected. It was something so alien that human physiology could not respond to it. A minute later, the wave front hit the next underwater barrier as it climbed away from them and up the sky. This time, seen from the rear, the spectacle was unimpressive, and the voyagers were ashamed of their previous fears. They began to feel themselves masters of the cylindrical sea. The shock was therefore all the greater when, not more than a hundred meters away, something like a slowly rotating wheel began to rear up out of the water. Glittering metallic spokes, five meters long, emerged dripping, spun for a moment in the fierce Raman glare, and splashed back. It was as if a giant starfish, with 
tubular arms had broken the surface. At first sight, it was impossible to tell whether it was an animal or a machine. Then it flopped over and lay half awash, bobbing up and down in the gentle aftermath of the wave. Now they could see that there were nine arms, apparently jointed, radiating from a central disk. Two of the arms were broken, snapped off at the outer joint. The others ended at a complicated collection of manipulators that reminded Jimmy strongly of the crab he had encountered. The two creatures came from the same line of evolution, or the same drawing board. At the middle of the disk was a small turret, bearing three large eyes. Two were closed, one open, and even that appeared to be blank and unseeing. No one doubted that they were watching the death throes of some strange monster tossed up to the surface by the submarine disturbance that had just passed. Then they saw that it was not alone. Swimming around it and snapping at its still feebly moving limbs were two small beasts like overgrown lobsters. They were efficiently chopping up the monster, and it did nothing to resist, though its own claws seemed quite capable of dealing with the attackers. Again, Jimmy was reminded of the crab that had demolished Dragonfly. He watched intently as the one-sided conflict continued and quickly confirmed his impression. Look, Skipper, he whispered. Do you see? They're not eating it. They don't even have any mouths. They're simply chopping it to pieces. That's exactly what happened to Dragonfly. You're right. They're dismantling it like... like a broken machine. Norton wrinkled his nose. But no dead machine ever smelled like that. Then another thought struck him. My God! Suppose they start on us. Ruby, get us back to shore as quickly as you can. Resolution surged forward with reckless disregard for the life of her power cells. Behind them, the nine spokes of the great starfish, they could think of no better name for it, were clipped steadily shorter, and presently the weird tableau sank back into the depths of the sea. There was no pursuit, but they did not breathe comfortably again until resolution had drawn up to the landing stage and they had stepped thankfully ashore. As he looked back across that mysterious and now sinister band of water, Norton grimly determined that no one would ever sail it again. There were too many unknowns, too many dangers. He looked back upon the towers and ramparts of New York and the dark cliff of the continent beyond. They were safe now from inquisitive man. He would not tempt the gods of Rama again. 33. Spider From now on, Norton had decreed there would always be at least three people at Camp Alpha, and one of them would always be awake. In addition, all exploring parties would follow the same routine. Potentially dangerous creatures were on the move inside Rama, and though none had shown active hostility, a prudent commander would take no chances. As an extra safeguard, there was always an observer up on the hub, keeping watch through a powerful telescope. From this vantage point, the whole interior of Rama could be surveyed, and even the South Pole appeared to be only a few hundred meters away. The territory around any group of explorers was to be kept under regular observation. In this way, it was hoped to eliminate any possibility of surprise. It was a good plan, and it failed completely. After the last meal of the day, and just before the 2200 sleep period, Norton, Rodrigo, Calvert, and Laura Ernst 
were watching the regular evening news telecast beamed specially to them from the transmitter at Inferno, Mercury. They had been particularly interested in seeing Jimmy's film of the Southern Hemisphere and the return across the cylindrical sea, an episode that had excited all viewers. Scientists, news commentators, and members of the Rama Committee had given their opinions, most of them contradictory. No one could agree whether the crab-like creature Jimmy had encountered was an animal, a machine, a genuine Raman, or something that fitted none of these categories. They had just been watching, with a distinctly queasy feeling, the giant starfish being demolished by its predators, when they discovered that they were no longer alone. There was an intruder in the camp. Laura Ernst noticed it first. She froze, then said, Don't move, Bill. Now look slowly to the right. Norton turned his head. Ten meters away was a slender-legged tripod surmounted by a spherical body no larger than a soccer ball. Set around the body were three large, expressionless eyes, apparently giving 360 degrees of vision, and trailing beneath it were three whip-like tendrils. The creature was not quite as tall as a man and looked far too fragile to be dangerous, but that did not excuse their carelessness in letting it sneak up on them unawares. It reminded Norton of nothing so much as a three-legged spider or daddy longlegs, and he wondered how it had solved the problem, never attempted by any creature on Earth, of tripedal locomotion. What do you make of it, Doc? He whispered, turning off the voice of the TV newscaster. Usual Raman threefold symmetry. I don't see how it could hurt us, though those whips might be unpleasant, and they could be poisonous, like a salenterates. Sit tight and see what it does. After regarding them impassively for several minutes, the creature suddenly moved, and now they could understand why they had failed to observe its arrival. It was fast, and it covered the ground with such an extraordinary spinning motion that the human eye and mind had real difficulty in following it. As far as Norton could judge, and only a high-speed camera could settle the matter, each leg in turn acted as a pivot around which the creature whirled its body. And he was not sure, but it also seemed to him that every few steps it reversed its direction of spin, while the three whips flickered over the ground like lightning as it moved. Its top speed, though this also was hard to estimate, seemed to be at least 30 kilometers an hour. It swept swiftly around the camp, examining every item of equipment, delicately touching the improvised beds and chairs and tables, communication gear, food containers, electrosands, cameras, water tanks, tools. There seemed to be nothing that it ignored except the four watchers. Clearly, it was intelligent enough to draw a distinction between humans and their inanimate property. Its actions gave the unmistakable impression of an extremely methodical curiosity or inquisitiveness. I wish I could examine it, Laura exclaimed in frustration as the creature continued its swift pirouette. Shall we try to catch it? How? Calvert asked, reasonably enough. You know the way primitive hunters bring down fast-moving animals with a couple of weights whirling around at the end of a rope? It doesn't even hurt them. That, I doubt, said Norton. But even if it worked, we can't risk it. We don't know how intelligent this creature is, and a trick like that could easily break its legs. Then we would be in real trouble from Rama, Earth, and everyone else. But I've got to have a specimen. You may have to be content with Jimmy's flower, unless one of these creatures cooperates with you. Force is out. 
How would you like it if something landed on Earth and decided that you would make a nice specimen for dissection? I don't want to dissect it, said Laura, not at all convincingly. I only want to examine it. Well, alien visitors might have the same attitude toward you, but you could have a very uncomfortable time before you believed them. We must make no move that could possibly be regarded as threatening. He was quoting from ship's orders, of course, and Laura knew it. The claims of science had a lower priority than those of space diplomacy. In fact, there was no need to bring in such elevated considerations. It was merely a matter of good manners. They were all visitors here and had never even asked permission to come inside. The creature seemed to have finished its inspection. It made one more high-speed circuit of the camp, then shot off at a tangent toward the stairway. I wonder how it's going to manage the steps, Laura mused. Her question was quickly answered. The spider ignored them completely and headed up the gently sloping curve of the ramp without slackening its speed. Hub control, said Norton. You may have a visitor shortly. Take a look at Stairway Alpha, Section 6. And incidentally, thanks a lot for keeping such a good watch on us. It took a minute for the sarcasm to sink in. Then the hub observer started to make apologetic noises. Uh, I can just see something, Skipper. Now you tell me it's there. But what is it? Okay. Your guess is as good as mine, Norton answered as he pressed the general alert button. Camp Alpha calling all stations. We've just been visited by a creature like a three-legged spider with very thin legs, about two meters high, small spherical body, travels very fast with a spinning motion, appears harmless but inquisitive. It may sneak up on you before you notice it. Please acknowledge. The first reply came from London, 15 kilometers to the east. Nothing unusual here, Skipper. From the same distance to the west, Rome answered, sounding suspiciously sleepy. Same here, Skipper. Uh, just a moment. What is it? I put my pen down a minute ago, and it's gone. What? Oh! Talk sense. You won't believe this, Skipper. I was making some notes. You know I like writing, and it doesn't disturb anybody. And I was using my favorite ballpoint. It's nearly 200 years old. Well, now it's lying on the ground, about five meters away. I've got it. Thank goodness it isn't damaged. And how do you suppose it got there? Uh... I may have dozed off for a minute. It's been a hard day. Norton sighed, but refrained from comment. There were so few of them, and they had so little time in which to explore a world. Enthusiasm could not always overcome exhaustion, and he wondered if they were taking unnecessary risks. Perhaps he should not split his men up into such small groups and try to cover so much territory, but he was always conscious of the swiftly passing days and the unsolved mysteries around them. He was becoming more and more certain that something was about to happen, and that they would have to abandon Rama even before it reached perihelion, the moment of truth when any orbit change must surely take place. Now listen, Hub, Rome, London, everyone, he said. I want to report every half hour through the night. We must assume that from now on we may have visitors at any time. Some of them may be dangerous, but at all costs we have to avoid incidents. You all know the directives on this subject. That was true enough. It was part of their training. Yet perhaps none of them had ever really believed that the long theorized physical contact with intelligent aliens would occur in their lifetimes, still less that they would experience it themselves. Training was one thing, reality another, 
and no one could be sure that the ancient human instincts of self-preservation would not take over in an emergency. Yet it was essential to give every entity they encountered in Rama the benefit of the doubt, up to the last possible minute, and even beyond. Commander Norton did not want to be remembered by history as the man who started the first interplanetary war. Within a few hours, there were hundreds of the spiders, and they were all over the plain. Through the telescope, it could be seen that the southern hemisphere was also infested with them, but not, it seemed, the island of New York. They took no further notice of the explorers, and after a while the explorers took little notice of them, though from time to time Norton detected a predatory gleam in his surgeon commander's eye. Nothing would please her better, he was sure, than for one of the spiders to have an unfortunate accident, and he would not put it past her to arrange such a thing in the interests of science. It seemed virtually certain that the spiders could not be intelligent. Their bodies were far too small to contain much in the way of brains, and indeed it was hard to see where they stored all the energy to move. Yet their behavior was curiously purposeful and coordinated. They appeared to be everywhere, but they never visited the same place twice. Norton frequently had the impression that they were searching for something. Whatever it was, they did not seem to have discovered it. They went all the way up to the central hub, scorning the three great stairways. How they managed to ascend the vertical sections, even under almost zero gravity, was not clear. Laura theorized that they were equipped with suction pads. And then, to her obvious delight, she got her eagerly desired specimen. Hub Control reported that a spider had fallen down the vertical face and was lying, dead or incapacitated, on the first platform. Laura's time up from the plane was a record that would never be beaten. When she arrived at the platform, she found that, despite the low velocity of impact, the creature had broken all its legs. Its eyes were open, but it showed no reactions to any external tests. Even a fresh human corpse would have been livelier, Laura thought. As soon as she got her prize back to the Endeavor, she started to work with her dissecting kit. The spider was so fragile that it almost came to pieces without her assistance. She disarticulated the legs, then started on the delicate carapace, which split along three great circles and opened up like a peeled orange. After some moments of blank incredulity, for there was nothing that she could recognize or identify, she took a series of careful photographs. Then she picked up her scalpel. Where to start cutting? She felt like closing her eyes and stabbing at random, but that would not have been very scientific. The blade went in with practically no resistance. A second later, Surgeon Commander Ernst's most unladylike yell echoed the length and breadth of endeavor. It took an annoyed Sergeant McAndrews a good twenty minutes to calm down the startled simps. 34. His Excellency regrets. As you are all aware, gentlemen, said the Martian ambassador, a great deal has happened since our last meeting. We have much to discuss and to decide. I'm therefore particularly sorry that our distinguished colleague from Mercury is not here. That last statement was not altogether accurate. Dr. Bose was not particularly sorry that His Excellency the Hermian Ambassador was absent. It would have been much more truthful to say that he was worried. All his diplomatic instincts told him that something was happening, and though his sources of information were excellent, he could gather no hints as to what it might be. The Ambassador's letter of apology 
had been courteous and entirely uncommunicative. His Excellency had regretted that urgent and unavoidable business had kept him from attending the meeting, either in person or by video. Dr. Bose found it hard to think of anything more urgent or more important than Rama. Two of our members have statements to make. I would first like to call on Professor Davidson. There was a rustle of excitement among the other scientists on the committee. Most of them had felt that the astronomer, with his well-known cosmic viewpoint, was not the right man to be chairman of the Space Advisory Council. He sometimes gave the impression that the activities of intelligent life were an unfortunate irrelevance in the majestic universe of stars and galaxies, and that it was bad manners to pay too much attention to them. This had not endeared him to exobiologists such as Dr. Pereira, who took exactly the opposite view. For them, the only purpose of the universe was the production of intelligence, and they were apt to talk sneeringly about purely astronomical phenomena. Mere dead matter was one of their favorite phrases. Mr. Ambassador, the scientist began, I have been analyzing the curious behavior of Rama during the last few days and would like to present my conclusions. Some of them are rather startling. Dr. Pereira looked surprised, then a little smug. He strongly approved of anything that startled Davidson. First of all, there was the remarkable series of events when that young lieutenant, he pronounced it lieutenant, flew over to the southern hemisphere. The electrical discharges themselves, though spectacular, are not important. It is easy to show that they contained relatively little energy, but they coincided with a change in Rama's rate of spin and its attitude, that is, its orientation in space. Keep left. This must have involved an enormous amount of energy. The discharges which nearly cost Mr. Uh, Pack his life were merely a minor byproduct, perhaps a nuisance that had to be minimized by those giant lightning conductors at the South Pole. I draw two conclusions from this. When a spacecraft, and we must call Rama a spacecraft, despite its fantastic size, makes a change of attitude. That usually means it is about to make a change of orbit. We must therefore take seriously the views of those who believe that Rama may be preparing to become another planet of our sun, instead of going back to the stars. If this is the case, Endeavor must obviously be prepared to cast off. Is that what spaceships do at a moment's notice? She may be in very serious danger while she is still physically attached to Rama. I imagine that Commander Norton is already well aware of this possibility, but I think we should send him an additional warning. Thank you very much, Professor Davidson. Yes, Professor Solomons. I'd like to comment on that, said the science historian. Rama seems to have made a change of spin without using any jets or reaction devices. This leaves only two possibilities, it seems to me. The first one is that it has internal gyroscopes, or their equivalent. They must be enormous. Where are they? The second possibility, which would turn all our physics upside down, is that it has a reactionless propulsion system, the so-called space drive, which Professor Davidson doesn't believe in. If this is the case, Rama may be able to do almost anything. We will be quite unable to anticipate its behavior, even on the gross physical level. The diplomats were obviously somewhat baffled by this exchange, and the astronomer refused to be drawn. He had gone out on enough limbs for one day. I'll stick to the laws of physics, if you don't mind, until I'm forced to give them up. If we've not found any gyroscopes in Rama, we may not have looked hard enough, or in the right place. Bose could see that Pereira was getting impatient. 
Normally, the exobiologist was as happy as anyone else to engage in speculation. But now, for the first time, he had some solid facts. His long impoverished science had become wealthy overnight. Very well. If there are no other comments, I know that Dr. Pereira has some important information. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. As you've all seen, we have at last obtained a specimen of a Rama life form and have observed several others at close quarters. Surgeon Commander Ernst, Endeavor's medical officer, has sent a full report on the spider-like creature she dissected. I must say at once that some of her results are baffling and in any other circumstances, I would have refused to believe them. This spider is definitely organic, though its chemistry differs from ours in many respects. It contains considerable quantities of light metals. Yet, I hesitate to call it an animal, for several fundamental reasons. In the first place, it seems to have no mouth, no stomach, no gut, no method of ingesting food. Also, no air intakes, no lungs, no blood, no reproductive system. You may wonder what it has got. Well, there's a simple musculature controlling its three legs and the three whip-like tendrils or feelers. There's a brain, fairly complex, mostly concerned with the creature's remarkably developed triocular vision, but 80% of the body consists of a honeycomb of large cells, and this is what gave Dr. Ernst such an unpleasant surprise when she started her dissection. If she'd been luckier, she might have recognized it in time, because it's the one Raman structure that does exist on Earth, though only in a handful of marine animals. Most of the spider is simply a battery, much like that found in electric eels and rays. But in this case, it's apparently not used for defense. It's the creature's source of energy. And that is why it has no provisions for eating and breathing. It doesn't need such primitive arrangements. And, incidentally, this means that it would be perfectly at home in a vacuum. So, we have a creature which to all intents and purposes, is nothing more than a mobile eye. It has no organs of manipulation. Those tendrils are much too feeble. If I had been given its specifications, I would have said it's merely a reconnaissance device. Its behavior certainly fits that description. All the spiders ever do is run around and look at things. That's all they can do. But the other animals are different. The crab, the starfish, the sharks, for want of better words. These can obviously manipulate their environment and appear to be specialized for various functions. I assume that they are also electrically powered, since, like the spider, they appear to have no mouths. I'm sure you'll appreciate the biological problems raised by all this. Could Keep such right creatures evolve naturally? Right. I really don't think so. They appear to be designed exit like machines right. for specific jobs. If I had to describe them, I would say that they are robots, biological robots, something that has no analogy on Earth. If Rama is a spaceship, perhaps they are part of its crew. As to how they are born, or created, that's something I can't tell you. But I can guess that the answer's over there in New York. If Commander Norton and his men can wait long enough, they may encounter increasingly more complex creatures with unpredictable behavior. Somewhere along the line, they may meet the Ramans themselves, the real makers of this world. And when that happens, gentlemen. There will be no doubt about it at all. 35. Special Delivery Commander Norton was sleeping soundly 
when his personal communicator dragged him away from happy dreams. He had been holidaying with his family on Mars, flying past the awesome snow-capped peak of Nix Olympica, mightiest volcano in the solar system. Little Billy had started to say something to him. Now he would never know what it was. The dream faded. The reality was his executive officer up on the ship. Sorry to wake you, Skipper, said Kirchhoff. Triple-A priority from headquarters. Let me have it, Norton answered sleepily. I can't. It's in code. Commander's eyes only. Norton was instantly awake. He had received such a message only three times in his whole career, and on each occasion it had meant trouble. Damn, he said. What do we do now? The exec did not bother to answer. Each understood the problem perfectly. It was one that ship's orders had never anticipated. Normally, a commander was never more than a few minutes away from his office and the code book in his personal safe. If he started now, Norton might get back to the ship, exhausted, in four or five hours. That was not the way to handle a triple-A priority. Jerry, he said at length, who's on the switchboard? No one. I'm making the call myself. Recorder off? By an odd breach of regulations, yes. Norton smiled. Jerry was the best exec he had ever worked with. He thought of everything. Okay. You know where my key is. Call me back. He waited as patiently as he could for the next ten minutes, trying, without much success, to think of other problems. He hated wasting mental effort. It was unlikely that he could guess the message that was coming, and he would know its contents soon enough. Then he could start worrying effectively. When Kirchhoff called back, he was obviously speaking under considerable strain. It's not really urgent, Skipper. An hour won't make any difference. But I prefer to avoid radio. I'll send it down by messenger. But why? Oh, very well. I trust your judgment. Who will carry it through the airlocks? I'm going myself. I'll call you when I reach the hub. Which leaves Laura in charge. For one hour at the most... I'll get right back to the ship. A medical officer did not have the specialized training to be acting captain, any more than a captain could be expected to perform an operation. In emergencies, the two jobs had sometimes been successfully switched, but it was not recommended. Well, one order had already been broken tonight. For the record, you never leave the ship. Have you waked Laura? Yes, she's delighted to have the opportunity. Lucky that doctors are used to keeping secrets. Oh, have you sent the acknowledgement? Of course, in your name. Then I'll be waiting. Now, it was quite impossible to avoid anxious anticipation. Not really urgent, but I prefer to avoid radio. One thing was certain. The commander was not going to get much more sleep this night. 36. Bayat Watcher Sergeant Peter Russo knew why he had volunteered for this job. In many ways, it was a realization of a childhood dream. He had become fascinated by telescopes when he was only six or seven years old, and much of his youth had been spent collecting lenses of all shapes and sizes. These he had mounted in cardboard tubes, making instruments of ever-increasing power until he was familiar with the moon and planets, the nearer space stations, and the entire Reed. landscape within 30 kilometers of his home. He had been lucky in his place of birth among the mountains of Colorado. Right. In almost every direction, the view was spectacular and inexhaustible. 
he had spent hours exploring, in perfect safety, the peaks that every year took their toll of careless climbers. Though he had seen much, he had imagined up. even more. He had liked to pretend that over each crest of rock, beyond the reach of his telescope, were magic kingdoms full of wonderful creatures. And so for years he had avoided visiting the places his lenses brought to him because he knew that the reality could not live up to the dream. Now, on the central axis of Rama, he could survey marvels beyond the wildest off. fantasies of his youth. A whole world lay spread out before him. A small one, it was true. Yet a man could spend a lifetime exploring 4,000 square kilometers, even when it was dead and changeless. But now life, with all its infinite possibilities, had come to Rama. If the biological robots were not living creatures, they were certainly very good imitations. No one knew who invented the word biot. It seemed to come into instant use by a kind of spontaneous generation. From his vantage point on the hub, Rousseau was biot watcher in chief, and he was beginning, so he believed, to understand some of their behavior patterns. The spiders were mobile sensors, using vision and probably touch to examine the whole interior of Rama. At one time, there had been hundreds of them rushing around at high speed, but after less than two days, most had disappeared. Now it was quite unusual to see even one. They had been replaced by a whole menagerie of much more impressive creatures, and it had been no minor task to think of suitable names for them. There were the window cleaners, with large, padded feet, who were apparently polishing their way the whole length of Rama's six artificial suns. Their enormous shadows, cast right across the diameter of the world, sometimes caused temporary eclipses on the far side. The crab that had demolished Dragonfly seemed to be a scavenger. A relay chain of identical creatures had approached Camp Alpha and carried off all the debris that had been neatly stacked on the outskirts. Right. They would have carried off everything else if Norton and Mercer had not stood firm and defied them. Exit. The confrontation right. had been anxious, but brief. Thereafter, the scavengers seemed to understand what they were allowed to touch and arrived at regular intervals to see if their services were required. It was a most convenient arrangement and indicated a high degree of intelligence on the part of either the scavengers themselves or some controlling entity elsewhere. Garbage disposal on Rama was simple. Everything was thrown into the sea, where it was presumably broken down into forms that could be used again. The process was rapid. Resolution had disappeared overnight, to the great annoyance of Ruby Barnes. Norton had consoled her by pointing out that it had done its job magnificently, and he would never have allowed anyone to use it again. The sharks might not be as discriminating as the scavengers. No astronomer discovering an unknown planet could have been happier than Rousseau was when he spotted a new type of biot and secured a good photo of it through his telescope. Unfortunately, it seemed that all the interesting species were over at the South Pole, where they were performing mysterious tasks around the horns. Something that looked like a centipede with suction pads could be seen from time to time exploring Bighorn itself, while Rousseau had caught a glimpse of a burly creature around the lower peaks that could have been a cross between a hippopotamus and a bulldozer. And there was even a double-necked giraffe, which apparently acted as a mobile crane. Presumably, Rama, like any ship, required testing, checking, and repairing after its immense voyage. The crew was already hard at work. When 
would the passengers appear? Bayat classifying was not Rousseau's main job. His orders were to keep watch on the two or three exploring parties that were always out, to see that they did not get into trouble, and to warn them if anything approached. He alternated every six hours with anyone else who could be spared, though more than once he had been on duty for twelve hours at a stretch. As a result, he now knew the geography of Rama better than any other man who would ever live. It was as familiar to him as the Colorado mountains of his youth. When Lieutenant Commander Kirchhoff emerged from Airlock Alpha, Rousseau knew at once that something unusual was happening. Personnel transfers never occurred during the sleeping period, and it was now past midnight by mission time. Then Rousseau remembered how short-handed they were, and was shocked by a much more startling irregularity. Jerry, who's in charge of the ship? I am, said the exec coldly as he flipped open his helmet. You don't think I'd leave the bridge while I'm on watch, do you? He reached into his suit carry-all and pulled out a small can bearing the label Concentrated Orange Juice to make five liters. You're good at this, Peter. The skipper is waiting for it. Rousseau hefted the can, then said, I hope you've put enough mass inside it. Sometimes they get stuck on the first terrace. Well... You're the expert. That was true enough. The hub observers had had plenty of practice sending down small items that had been forgotten or were needed in a hurry. The trick was to get them safely past the low gravity region and then to see that the Coriolis effect did not carry them too far away from the camp during the eight kilometer roll downhill. Rousseau anchored himself firmly grasped the can, and hurled it down the face of the cliff. He did not aim directly toward Camp Alpha, but almost 30 degrees away from it. Almost immediately, air resistance robbed the can of its initial speed, but then the pseudo-gravity of Rama took over, and it started to move downward at a constant velocity. It hit once near the base of the ladder, and did a slow-motion bounce, which took it clear of the first terrace. It's okay now, said Rousseau. Like to make a bet? No, was the prompt reply. You know the odds. You're no sportsman, but I'll tell you now, it will stop within 300 meters of the camp. That doesn't sound very close. You might try it sometime. I once saw Joe miss by a couple of kilometers. The can was no longer bouncing. Gravity had become strong enough to glue it to the curving face of the North Dome. By the time it had reached the second terrace, it was rolling along at 20 or 30 kilometers an hour and had reached nearly the maximum speed that friction would allow. Now we'll have to wait, said Rousseau seating himself at the telescope so that he could keep track of the messenger. It will be there in ten minutes. Ah, here comes the skipper. I've got used to recognizing people from this angle. Now he's looking up at us. I believe that telescope gives you a sense keep of power. Right. And then oh, it does. I'm the only person who knows everything that's happening in Rama. At least, exit. I right. thought I did. He added plaintively giving Kirchhoff a reproachful look. If it will keep you happy, the skipper found he'd run out of toothpaste. After that, conversation languished, but at last Rousseau said, Wish you'd taken that bet. He's only got to walk 50 meters. Now he sees it. Mission complete. Thanks, Peter. A very good job. Now you can go back to sleep. Sleep? I'm on watch until 0400. Sorry, you must have been sleeping. Or how else could you have dreamed all this? Space Survey Headquarters to Commander SSS Endeavor. Priority Triple A. 
Classification, your eyes only. Go straight No up. permanent record. Space Guard reports ultra-high-speed vehicle apparently launched Mercury 10 to 12 days ago on Rama intercept. If no orbit change, arrival predicted date 322 days, 15 hours. May be necessary you evacuate before then. Will advise further, C in C. Norton read the message half a dozen times to memorize the date. It was hard to keep track of time inside Rama. He had to look at his calendar watch to see that it was now day 315. That might leave them only keep one week. Right. The message was chilling, not only for what it said, but also for what it implied. The Hermians had made a clandestine launch, which in itself was a breach of space law. The conclusion was obvious. Their vehicle could only be a missile. But why? It was inconceivable, well, almost inconceivable, that they would risk endangering Endeavor. So presumably he would receive ample warning from the Hermians themselves. In an emergency, he could leave at a few hours' notice, though he would do so only under extreme protest, at the direct orders of the Commander-in-Chief. Slowly and thoughtfully, he walked across to the improvised life support complex and dropped the message into an electrosan. The brilliant flare of laser light bursting out through the crack beneath the seat cover told him that the demands of security were satisfied. It was too bad, he told himself, that all problems could not be disposed of so swiftly and hygienically. 37. Missile. The missile was still five million kilometers away when the glare of its plasma braking jets became clearly visible in Endeavour's main telescope. By that time, the secret was out, and Norton had reluctantly ordered the second and perhaps final evacuation of Rama. But he had no intention of leaving until events gave him no alternative. When it had completed its braking maneuver, the unwelcome guest from Mercury was only 50 kilometers from Rama, and apparently carrying out a survey through its TV cameras. These were clearly visible, one fore and one aft, as were several small omni antennas and one large directional dish aimed steadily at the distant star of Mercury. Norton wondered what instructions were coming down that beam Never and mind. what information find a new was route. going back. Yet the Hermians could learn nothing that they did not already know. All that Endeavor had discovered had been broadcast throughout the solar system. This spacecraft, which had broken all speed records to get here, could be only an extension of its maker's right. will, an instrument of their purpose. That purpose would soon be known, for in three hours the Hermian ambassador to the United Planets would be addressing the General Assembly. Officially, the missile did not exist. It bore no identification marks and was not radiating on any standard beacon frequency. This was a serious breach of law, but even Space Guard had not yet issued a formal protest. Everyone was waiting, with nervous impatience, to see what Mercury would do next. It had been three days since the missile's existence and origin had been announced. All that time, the Hermians had remained stubbornly silent. They could be good at that when it suited them. Some psychologists had claimed that it was almost impossible to understand fully the mentality of anyone born and bred on Mercury, forever exiled from Earth by its three times more powerful gravity, Hermians could stand on the moon and look across the narrow gap to the planet of their ancestors, even of their own parents, but they could never 
visit it. And so, inevitably, they claimed that they did not want to. They pretended to despise the soft rains, the rolling fields, the lakes and seas, the blue skies, all the things that they could know only through recordings. Because their planet was drenched with such solar energy that the daytime temperature often reached 600 degrees, they affected a rather swaggering toughness that did not bear a moment's serious examination. In fact, they tended to be physically weak, since they could survive only if they were totally insulated from their environment. Even if he could have tolerated the gravity, a Hermian would have been quickly incapacitated by a hot day in any equatorial country on Earth. Yet, in matters that really counted, they were Keep tough. Yeah. The psychological pressures of that ravening star so close at hand, the engineering problems of tearing into a stubborn planet and wrenching from it all the necessities of life, these had produced a Spartan and, in many ways, highly admirable culture. You could rely on the Hermians. If they promised something, they would do it, though the bill might be considerable. It was their own joke that if the sun ever showed signs of going nova, they would contract to get it under control, once the fee had been settled. It was a non-Hermian joke that any child who showed signs of interest in art, philosophy, or abstract mathematics was plowed straight back into the hydroponic farms. As far as criminals and psychopaths were concerned, this was not a joke at all. Crime was one of the luxuries that Mercury could not afford. Commander Norton had been to Mercury once, had been enormously impressed, like most visitors, and had acquired many Hermian friends. He had fallen in love with a girl in Port Lucifer, and had even contemplated signing a three-year contract, but parental disapproval of anyone from outside the orbit of Venus had been too strong. It was just as well. Triple A message from Earth, Skipper, said the bridge. Voice and backup text from Commander-in-Chief. Ready to accept? Check and file text. Let me have the voice. Here it comes. Admiral Hendricks sounded calm and matter-of-fact, as if he were issuing a routine fleet order instead of handling a situation unique in the history of space. But then, he was not ten kilometers from the bomb. C&C to Commander Endeavor. This is a quick summary of the situation as we see it now. You know that the General Assembly meets at 1400, and you'll be listening to the proceedings. It is possible that you may then have to take action immediately, without consultation, hence this briefing. We've analyzed the photos you have sent us. The vehicle is a standard space probe, modified for high impulse and probably laser riding for initial boost. Size and mass are consistent with fusion bomb in the 500 to 1000 megaton range. The Hermians use up to 100 megatons routinely in their mining operations, so they would have had no difficulty in assembling such a warhead. Our experts also estimate that this would be the minimum size necessary to assure destruction of Rama. If it was detonated against the thinnest part of the shell underneath the cylindrical sea, the hull would be ruptured, and the spin of the body would complete its disintegration. We assume that the Hermians, if they are planning such an act, will give you ample time to get clear. For your information, the gamma ray flash from such a bomb could be dangerous to you up to a range of a thousand kilometers. But that is not the most serious danger. The fragments of Rama, weighing tons and spinning off at almost a thousand kilometers an hour, could destroy you at an unlimited distance. We therefore recommend that you proceed along the spin axis, since no fragments will be thrown off in that direction. 10,000 kilometers should give an adequate safety margin. This message cannot be intercepted, 
It is going by multiple pseudo-random routing, so I can talk in clear English. Your reply may not be secure, so speak with discretion and use code when necessary. I will call you immediately after the General Assembly discussion. Message concluded. CNC out. 38. General Assembly. According to the history books, though no one could really believe it, there had been a time when the old United Nations had 172 members. The United Planets had only seven, and that was sometimes bad enough. In order of distance from the Sun, they were Mercury, Earth, Luna, Mars, Ganymede, Titan, and Triton. The list contained numerous omissions and ambiguities, which presumably the future would rectify. Critics never tired of pointing out that most of the United Planets were not planets at all, but satellites. And how ridiculous that the four giants, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, were not included. But no one lived on the gas giants, and quite possibly no one ever would. The same might be true of the other major absentee, Venus. Even the most enthusiastic of planetary engineers agreed that it would take centuries to tame Venus. Meanwhile, the Hermians kept their eyes on it, and doubtless brooded over long-range plans. Separate representation for Earth and Luna had also been a bone of contention. The other members argued that it put too much power in one corner of the solar system. But there were more people on the moon than on all the other worlds, except Earth itself, and it was the meeting place of the UP. Moreover, Earth and Moon hardly ever agreed on anything, so they were not likely to constitute a dangerous block. Mars held the asteroids in trust except for the Icarian group, supervised by Mercury, and a handful with perihelions beyond Saturn, and thus claimed by Titan. One day, the larger asteroids, such as Pallas, Vesta, Juno, and Ceres, would be important enough to have their own ambassadors, and the membership of the UP would then reach two figures. Ganymede represented not only Jupiter, and therefore more mass than all the rest of the solar system put together, but also the remaining 50 or so Jovian satellites, if one included temporary captures from the asteroid belt, though lawyers were still arguing over this. In the same way, Titan took care of Saturn, its rings, and the other 30-plus satellites. The situation for Triton was even more complicated. The large moon of Neptune was the outermost body in the solar system under permanent habitation. As a result, its ambassador wore a considerable number of hats. He represented Uranus and its eight moons, none yet occupied. Neptune and its other three satellites, Pluto and its solitary moon, and Keep lonely, right. and moonless Persephone. Right. If there were planets beyond Persephone, they, too, would be Triton's responsibility. And, as if that was not enough, the ambassador Excellent. from outer right. darkness, as he was sometimes called, had been heard to ask Keep plaintively, right. and then What about right. comets? It was generally felt that this turn problem right. could be left for the future to solve. And yet, in a real sense, that future was already here. By some definitions, Rama was a comet. They were the only Go other visitors on. from the interstellar deeps, and many had traveled on hyperbolic orbits even closer to the sun than Rama's. Any space lawyer could make a good case out of that, and the Hermian ambassador was one of the best. Go straight on. We recognize His Excellency the Ambassador from Mercury. Because the delegates were arranged counterclockwise in order of distance from the sun, the Hermian was on the president's extreme right. 
Up to the very last minute he had been interfacing with his computer. Now he removed the synchronizing spectacles that allowed no one else to read the message on the display screen. He picked up his sheaf of notes and rose briskly to his feet. Mr. President, distinguished fellow delegates, I would like to begin with a brief summary of the situation which now confronts us. From some delegates, that phrase, a brief summary, would have evoked silent Go groans from on, all listeners. And then keep right. But everyone knew that Hermians meant exactly what they said. Keep right, and then turn the right. giant spaceship or artificial asteroid, which has been christened Rama, right. was detected over a year ago in the region beyond Jupiter. At first, it was believed to be a natural body, moving on a hyperbolic orbit that would take it around the sun and on to the stars. When its true nature was discovered, the solar survey vessel Endeavour was ordered to rendezvous with it. I am sure we will all want to congratulate Commander Norton and his crew for the efficient way in which they have carried out their unique assignment. At first, it was believed that Rama was dead, frozen for so many hundreds of thousands of years that there was no possibility of revival. Off. This may still be true in a strictly biological sense. There seems general agreement among those who have studied the matter that no living organism of any complexity can survive more than a few centuries of suspended animation. Even at absolute zero, residual quantum effects eventually erase too much cellular information to make revival possible. It therefore appeared that Although Rama was of enormous archaeological importance, it did not present any major astropolitical problems. It is now obvious that this was a very naive attitude, though even from the first, there were some who pointed out that Rama was too precisely aimed at the sun for pure chance to be involved. Even so, it might have been argued, indeed it was argued, that here was an experiment that had failed. Rama had reached the intended target, but the controlling intelligence had not survived. This view also seems very simple-minded. It surely underestimates the entities we are dealing with. What we failed to take into account was the possibility of non-biological survival. If we accept Dr. Pereira's very plausible theory, which certainly fits all the facts, the creatures who have been observed inside Rama did not exist until a short time ago. Keep left, and Their then patterns turn left. or templates were stored in some central information bank, and when the time was turn ripe, left. they were manufactured from available raw materials, presumably the organometallic soup of the cylindrical sea. Such a feat is still somewhat beyond our own ability, but does not present any theoretical problems. We know that solid-state circuits, unlike living matter, can store information without loss for indefinite periods of time. So Rama is now in full operating condition, serving the purpose of its builders, whoever they may be. From our point of view, it does not matter if the Ramans themselves have all been dead for a million years, or whether they, too, will be recreated to join their servants at any moment. With or without them, their will is being done, Ready and will roll. continue to be done. Rama has now given proof that its propulsion system is still operating. In a few days, it will be at perihelion, where it would logically make any major orbit change. We may therefore soon have a new planet, moving through the solar space over which my government has jurisdiction. Or it may, of course, make additional changes and occupy a final orbit at any distance from the sun. It could even become a satellite of a major planet, such as Earth. We are therefore, fellow delegates, faced with a whole spectrum of possibilities, some of them very serious indeed. It is foolish to pretend that these creatures must be benevolent right. and will not interfere with us in any way. 
if they come to our solar system, they need something from it. Even if it is only scientific knowledge, consider how that knowledge may be used. What confronts us now is a technology hundreds, perhaps thousands of years okay. in advance of ours, and a culture that may have no points of contact with ours whatsoever. We have been studying the behavior of the biological robots, the biots, inside Rama, as shown in the films that Commander Norton has relayed, and we have arrived at certain conclusions, which we wish to pass on to you. On Mercury, we are perhaps unlucky in having no indigenous life forms to observe, but, of course, we have a complete record of terrestrial zoology, and we find in it one striking parallel with Rama. This is the termite colony. Like Rama, it is an artificial world with a controlled environment. Like Rama, its functioning depends upon a whole series of specialized biological machines. Workers, builders, farmers, warriors. And although we do not know if Rama has a queen, I suggest that the island known as New York serves a similar function. Now, it would obviously be absurd to press this analogy too far. It breaks down at many points. But I put it to you for this reason. What degree of cooperation or understanding would ever be possible between human beings and termites? When there is no conflict of interest, we tolerate each other. But when either needs the other's territory or resources, no quarter is given. Thanks to our technology and our intelligence, we can always win if we are sufficiently determined. But sometimes it is not easy, and there are those who believe that final victory may go to the termites. With this in mind, consider now the appalling threat that Rama may, I do not say must, present left, to human and civilization. Then turn left. What steps have we taken to counter it? if the worst eventuality should occur. Turn left. None whatsoever. We have merely talked and speculated and written learned papers. Well, my fellow delegates, Mercury has done more than this. Acting under the provisions of Clause 34 of the Space Treaty of 2057, which entitles us to take any steps necessary to protect the integrity of our solar space, we have dispatched a high-energy nuclear device to Rama. We will indeed be happy if we never have to utilize it. But now, at least, we are not helpless, as we were before. It may be argued that we have acted unilaterally, without prior consultation. We admit that. But does anyone here imagine, with all respect, Mr. President, that we could have secured any such agreement in the time available? Go straight on. We consider that we are acting not only for ourselves, but also for the whole human race. All future generations may one day thank us for our foresight. We recognize that it would be a tragedy, even a crime, to destroy an artifact as wonderful as Rama. If there is any way in which this can be avoided, without risk to humanity, we will be very happy to hear of it. We have not found one, and time is running out. Within the next few days, before Rama reaches perihelion, the choice will have to be made. We will, of course, give ample warning to Endeavor, but we would advise Commander Norton always to be ready to leave at an hour's notice. It is conceivable that Rama may undergo further dramatic transformations at any moment. That is all, Mr. President, fellow delegates. I thank you for your attention. I look forward to your cooperation. 39. Command Decision Well, Boris... How do the Hermians fit into your theology? Only too well, Commander, replied Lieutenant Rodrigo 
with a humorless smile. It's the age-old conflict between the forces of good and the forces of evil. And there are times when men have to take sides in such a conflict. I knew it would be something like that, Norton thought. This situation must have been a shock to Boris, but he would not have resigned himself to passive acquiescence. The Cosmo Christers were energetic, competent people. Indeed, in some ways, they were remarkably like the Hermians. I take it you have a plan, Boris. Yes, Commander. It's really quite simple. We merely have to disable the bomb. Oh. And how do you propose to do that? With a small pair of wire cutters. If this had been anyone else, Norton would have assumed that he was joking. But not... Boris Rodrigo. Now, just a minute. It's bristling with cameras. Do you suppose the Hermians will just sit and watch you? Of course. That's all they can do. When the signal reaches them, it will be far too late. I can easily finish the job in ten minutes. I see. They certainly will be mad. But suppose the bomb is booby-trapped so that interference sets it off. That seems very unlikely. What would be the purpose? This bomb was built for a specific deep space mission, and it will be fitted with all sorts of safety devices to prevent detonation except on a positive command. But that's a risk I'm prepared to take, and it can be done without endangering the ship. I've worked everything out. I'm sure you have, said Norton. The idea was fascinating, almost seductive in its appeal. He particularly liked the idea of the frustrated Hermians, and would give a good deal to see their reactions when they realized too late what was happening to their deadly toy. But there were other complications, and they seemed to multiply as Norton surveyed the problem. He was facing by far the most difficult and the most crucial decision of his entire career. And that was a ridiculous understatement. He was faced with the most difficult decision any commander had ever had to make. The future of the entire human race might well depend upon it. For just suppose the Hermians were right. When Rodrigo had left... Norton switched on the Do Not Disturb sign. He could not remember when he had last used it, and was mildly surprised that it was working. Now, in the heart of his crowded, busy ship, he was completely alone, except for the portrait of Captain James Cook, gazing at him down the corridors of time. It was impossible to consult with Earth. He had already been warned that any messages might be tapped, perhaps by relay devices on the bomb itself. That left the whole responsibility in his hands. There was a story he had heard somewhere about a president of the United States, was it Truman or Perez, who had a sign on his desk saying, The buck stops here. Norton was not quite certain what a buck was, but he knew when one had stopped at his desk. He could choose to do nothing and wait until the Hermians advised him to leave. How would that look in the histories of the future? Though Norton was not greatly concerned with posthumous fame or infamy, he would not care to be remembered forever as the accessory to a cosmic crime that it had been in his power to prevent. And the plan was flawless. As he would have expected, Rodrigo had worked out every detail, anticipated every possibility, even the remote danger that the bomb might be triggered when tampered with. If that happened, Endeavor could still be safe behind the shield of Rama. As for Rodrigo himself, he seemed to regard the possibility of instant apotheosis with complete equanimity. Yet, even if the bomb was successfully disabled, that would be far from the end of the matter. 
the Hermians might try again, unless some way could be found of stopping them. But at least weeks of time would have been bought. Rama would be far past perihelion before another missile could possibly reach it. By then, the worst fears of the alarmists might have been disproved. Or the reverse. To act or not act, that was the question. Never before had Norton felt such a close kinship with the Prince of Denmark. Whatever he did, the possibilities for good or evil seemed in perfect balance. He was faced with the most morally difficult of all decisions. If his choice was wrong, he would know very quickly. But if he was right, he might never be able to prove it. It was no use relying any further on logical arguments and the endless mapping of alternative futures. That way, one could go around in circles forever. The time had come to listen to his inner voices. He returned the calm, steady gaze of Cook from across the centuries. I agree with you, Captain, he whispered. The human race has to live with its conscience. Whatever the Hermians argue, survival is not everything. He pressed the call button for the bridge circuit and said slowly, Lieutenant Rodrigo, I'd like to see you. Then he closed his eyes, hooked his thumbs in the restraining straps of his chair, and prepared to enjoy a few moments of total relaxation. It might be some time before he would experience it again. 40. Saboteur The scooter had been stripped of all unnecessary equipment. It was now merely an open framework holding together propulsion, guidance, and life support systems. Even the seat for the second pilot Keep had left, been removed, and then turn for left. every kilogram of extra mass had to be paid for in mission time. That turn was one left. of the reasons, though not the most important, why Rodrigo had insisted on going alone. It was such a simple job that there was no need for extra hands, and the mass of a passenger would cost several minutes of flight time. Now the stripped-down scooter could accelerate at over a third of a gravity. It could make the trip from Endeavour to the bomb in four minutes. That left six to spare. It should be sufficient. Rodrigo looked back only once when he had left the ship. He saw that, as planned, it had lifted from the central axis and was thrusting gently away across the spinning disk of the north face. By the time he reached the bomb, it would have placed the thickness of Rama between them. He took his time flying over the polar plane. There was no hurry here, because the bomb's cameras could not yet see him, and he could therefore conserve fuel. Then he drifted over the curving rim of the world, and there was the missile glittering in sunlight, fiercer even than that shining on the planet of its birth. Rodrigo had already punched in the guidance instructions. Now he initiated the sequence, and the scooter spun on its gyros and came up to full thrust in a matter of seconds. At first, the sensation of weight seemed crushing. Then Rodrigo adjusted to it. He had, after all, comfortably endured twice as much inside Rama, and had been born under three times as much on Earth. The huge, curving exterior wall of the fifty-kilometer cylinder was slowly falling away beneath him as the scooter aimed itself directly at the bomb. Yet it was impossible to judge Rama's size, since it was completely smooth and so lacking in features that it was difficult to tell that it was spinning. One hundred seconds into the mission, he was approaching the halfway point. The bomb was too far away to show any details, 
but it was much brighter against the jet black sky. It was strange to see no stars, not even brilliant Earth or dazzling Venus. The dark filters which protected his eyes against the deadly glare made that impossible. Rodrigo guessed that he was breaking a record. Probably no other man had ever engaged in extravehicular work so close to the sun. It was lucky for him that solar activity was low. At two minutes ten seconds, the flip-over light started flashing. Thrust dropped to zero, and the scooter spun through 180 degrees. Full thrust was back in an instant, but now he was decelerating at the same mad rate of three meters per second squared. Rather better than that, in fact, since he had lost almost half his propellant mass. The bomb was 25 kilometers away. He would be there in another two minutes. He had hit a top speed of 1,500 kilometers per hour, which, for a space scooter, was utter insanity, and probably another record. But this was hardly a routine EVA, and he knew precisely what he was doing. The bomb was growing, and now he could see the main antenna holding steady on the invisible star of Mercury. Along that beam, the image of his approaching scooter had been flashing at the speed of light for the last three minutes. There were still two to go before it reached Mercury. What would the Hermians do when they saw him? There would be consternation, of course. They would realize instantly that he had made a rendezvous with the bomb several minutes before they even knew he was on the way. Probably some standby observer would call higher authority. That would take more time. But even in the worst possible case, even if the officer on duty had authority to detonate the bomb and pressed the button immediately, it would take another five minutes for the signal to arrive. Though Rodrigo was not gambling on it, Cosmo Chrysters never gambled. He was quite sure that there would be no such instantaneous reaction. The Hermians would hesitate to destroy a reconnaissance vehicle from Endeavor, even if they suspected its motives. They would certainly attempt some on. form of communication first, and that would mean more delay. And there was an even better reason. They would not waste a gigaton bomb on a mere scooter. Wasted it would be if it was detonated 20 kilometers from its target. They would have to move it first. Oh, he had plenty of time. But he would continue to assume the worst. He would act as if the triggering impulse were going to arrive in the shortest possible time. Just five minutes. As the scooter closed in across the last few hundred meters, Rodrigo quickly matched the details he could now see Go with straight. those he had studied in the photographs taken at long range. What had been only a collection of pictures left, became hard and metal left. and smooth plastic, no longer abstract, but a deadly keep reality. Left, and then turn left. The bomb was a cylinder about ten meters long and three turn in left. diameter. By a strange coincidence, almost the same proportions as those of Rama. It was attached to the framework of the carrier vehicle by an open latticework of short I-beams. For some reason, probably to do with the location of the center of mass, it was supported at right angles to the axis of the carrier so that it conveyed an appropriately sinister left, hammerhead impression. Left. It was indeed a hammer one powerful enough to smash a world. Turn left. From each end of the bomb, a bundle of braided cables ran along the cylindrical side this is where and disappeared ends. through the latticework into the interior of the vehicle. All communication and control was here. There was no antenna of any kind on the bomb itself. Rodrigo had only to cut those two sets of cables, and there would be nothing left but harmless, inert metal. 
Although this was exactly what he had expected, it seemed a little too easy. He glanced at his watch. It would be another thirty seconds before the Hermians, even if they had been watching when he rounded the edge of Rama, could know of his existence. He had an absolutely certain five minutes for uninterrupted work, and a ninety-nine percent probability of much longer than that. As soon as the scooter had drifted to a complete halt, Rodrigo grappled it to the missile framework so that the two formed a rigid structure. That took only seconds. He had already chosen his tools and was out of the pilot's seat at once, only slightly hampered by the stiffness of his heavy insulation suit. The first thing he found himself inspecting was a small metal plate bearing this inscription. Department of Power Engineering, Section D, 47 Sunset Boulevard, Vulcanopolis, 17464. For information, apply to Henry K. Jones. Rodrigo suspected that in a very few minutes, Mr. Jones might be rather busy. The heavy wire cutters made short work of the cable. As the first strands parted, Rodrigo gave scarcely a thought to the fires of hell that were pent up only centimeters away. If his actions triggered them, he would never know. He glanced again at his watch. This had taken less than a minute, which meant that he was on schedule. Now for the backup cable, and then he could head for home, in full view of the furious and frustrated Hermians. He was just beginning to work on the second cable assembly when he felt a faint vibration in the metal he was touching. Startled, he looked back along the body of the missile. Drive safe. The characteristic blue-violet glow of a plasma thruster in action was hovering around one of the attitude control jets. The bomb was preparing to move. An hour from receipt of this message to leave vicinity of Rama. Suggest you proceed maximum acceleration along spin axis. Request acknowledgement. Message ends. Norton read it with sheer disbelief, followed by anger. He felt a childish impulse to radio back that all his crew were inside Rama and it would take hours to get everyone out, but that would achieve nothing, except perhaps to test the will and nerve of the Hermians. And why, several days before Perihelion, had they decided to act? He wondered if the mounting pressure of public opinion was becoming too great, and they had decided to present the rest of the human race with a fait accompli. It seemed an unlikely explanation, because such sensitivity would have been uncharacteristic. There was no way in which he could recall Rodrigo, for the scooter was now in the radio shadow of Rama and would be out of contact until they were in line of sight again. That would not be until the mission was completed to turn or had failed. He would have to wait it out. There was still turn plenty of time, a full fifty left. minutes. Meanwhile, he had decided on the most effective answer to Mercury. He would ignore the message completely Keep and left, see what and the Hermians did next. Rodrigo's first sensation when the bomb started to move was not one of physical fear. It was something much more devastating. He believed that the universe operated according to strict laws, which not even God could disobey, much Keep less right. the Hermians. No message could travel faster than light. He was five minutes ahead of anything that Mercury could do. This could only be a coincidence, fantastic and perhaps deadly, but no more than that. By chance, a control signal must have been sent to the bomb at about the time he was leaving Endeavour. While he was traveling 50 kilometers, it had covered 80 million. Or perhaps this was only an automatic right, change of attitude to right. counter overheating somewhere in the vehicle. 
There were places where the skin temperature approached 1,500 degrees, and he had been very careful to keep in the shadows as far as possible. A second thruster started to fire, checking the spin given by the first. No, this was not a mere thermal adjustment. The bomb was reorientating itself to point toward Rama. Useless to wonder why this was happening at this precise moment in time. There was one thing in his favor. The missile was a low acceleration device. A tenth of a G was the most that it could manage. He could hang on. He checked the grapples attaching the scooter to the bomb framework and rechecked the safety line on his Get own suit. To turn right. A cold anger was growing in him, adding to his determination. Turn right. Did this maneuver mean that the Hermians were going to explode the bomb without warning, giving Endeavor no chance to escape? That seemed incredible, an act not only of brutality, but also of folly, calculated to turn the rest of the solar system against them, and what would have made them ignore the solemn promise of their own ambassador? Whatever their plan, get ready they would not right. get away with it. The second message from Mercury was identical with the first and arrived ten minutes later. So they had extended Turn the right. deadline. Norton still had one hour. And they had obviously waited until a reply from Endeavor could have reached them before calling him again. Now there was another factor. By this time they must have seen Rodrigo and would have had several minutes in which to take action. Their instructions could already be on the way. They could arrive at any second. Let's do this. He should be preparing to leave. At any moment, the sky-filling bulk of Rama might become incandescent along the edges blazing with a transient glory that would far outshine the sun. When the main thrust came on, Rodrigo was securely anchored. Only twenty seconds later, it cut off again. He did a quick mental calculation. The, right. the Delta V could not have been more than fifteen kilometers an hour. The bomb would take over an hour to reach Rama. Perhaps it was only moving in close to get a quicker reaction. If so, that was a wise precaution. But the Hermians had left it too late. Turn he glanced at his watch, though by now he was almost aware of the time without having to check. On Mercury, they would now be seeing him heading purposefully toward the bomb, and less than two kilometers away from it. They could have no doubt of his intentions, and would be wondering if he had already carried them out. The second set of cables went as easily as the first. Like any good workman, Rodrigo had chosen his tools well. The bomb was disarmed. Or, to be more accurate, it could no longer be detonated by remote command. Keep left, and Yet, then turn Yet, there left. was one other possibility and he could not afford to ignore it. There were no external contact fuses, Turn but there might be internal ones that would be armed by the shock of impact. The Hermians still had control over their vehicle's movement, and so could left. crash it into Rama whenever they wished. Rodrigo's work was not yet finished. Turn left, and then turn Five right. minutes from now, in that control room somewhere on Mercury, they would see him crawling back Turn along right. the exterior of the missile, carrying the modest-sized wire cutters that had neutralized the mightiest weapon ever built by man. He was almost tempted to wave at the camera, but decided that it would seem undignified. After all, he was making history, and millions would watch this scene in the years to come. Unless, of course, the Hermians destroyed the recording in a fit of pique. He would hardly blame them. He reached the mounting of the long-range antenna and drifted hand over hand along it to the big dish. His faithful cutters made short work of the multiplex feed system, 
chewing up cables and laser waveguides alike. When he made the last snip, the antenna started to swing slowly around. The unexpected movement took him by surprise, until he realized that he had destroyed its automatic lock on Mercury. Just five minutes from now, the Hermians would lose all contact with their servant. Not only was it impotent, now it was blind and deaf. Rodrigo climbed slowly back to the scooter, released the shackles, and swung it around until the forward bumpers were pressing against the missile as close as possible to its center of mass. He brought thrust up to full power and held it there for 20 seconds. Pushing against many times its own mass, the scooter responded very sluggishly. When Rodrigo cut the thrust back to zero, he took a careful reading of the bomb's new velocity vector. It would miss Rama by a wide margin, and it could be located again with precision at any future time. It was, after all, a valuable piece of equipment. Rodrigo was a man of almost pathological honesty. He would not like the Hermians to accuse him of losing their property. 41. Hero Darling, began Norton, this nonsense has cost us more than a day, but at least it's given me a chance to talk to you. Oh, I'm still in the ship, and she's heading back to station at the polar axis. We picked up Boris an hour ago, looking as if he'd just come off duty after a quiet watch. I suppose neither of us will ever be able to visit Mercury again, and I'm wondering if we're going to be treated as heroes or villains when we get back to Earth. But my conscience is clear. I'm sure we did the right thing. I wonder if the Ramans will ever say thank you. We can stay here only two more days. Unlike Rama, we don't have a kilometer-thick skin to protect us from the sun. The hull's already developing dangerous hot spots, and we've had to put out some local screening. I'm sorry. I didn't want to bore you with my problems. So there's time for just one more trip into Rama, and I intend to make the most of it. But don't worry. I'm not taking any chances. He stopped the recording. That, to say the least, was stretching the truth. There was danger and uncertainty about every moment inside Rama. No man could ever feel really at home there, in the presence of forces beyond his understanding. And on this final trip, now that he knew they would never return, and that no future operations would be jeopardized, he intended to press his luck just a little further. Keep left. In 48 hours, then, we'll have completed this mission. What happens after that is uncertain. As you know, we've used virtually all our fuel getting into this orbit. I'm still waiting to hear if a tanker can rendezvous with us in time to get back to Earth, or whether we'll have to make planetfall on Mars. Anyway, I should be home by Christmas. Tell Junior I'm sorry I can't bring a baby by art. There's no such animal. We're all fine, but we're very tired. I've earned a long leave after all this, and we'll make up for lost time. Whatever they say about me, you can claim you're married to a hero. How many wives have a husband who saved a world? As always, he listened carefully to the tape before duping it, to make sure that it was applicable to both his families. It was strange to think that he did not know which of them he would see first. Usually his schedule was determined at least a year in advance by the inexorable movements of the planets themselves. But that was in the days before Rama. Now, nothing would ever be the same again. 42. Temple of Glass if we try it, said Carl Mercer, do you think the Bayats will stop us? They may. That's one of the things I want to find out. 
Why are you looking at me like that? Mercer gave his slow, secret grin, which was liable to be set off at any moment by a private joke he might or might not share with his shipmates. I was wondering, Skipper, if you think you own Rama. Until now, you've vetoed any attempts to cut into buildings. Why the switch? Have the Hermians given you ideas? Norton laughed, then suddenly checked himself. It was a shrewd question, and he was not sure if the obvious answers were the right ones. Perhaps I have been ultra-cautious. I've tried to avoid trouble. But this is our last chance. If we are forced to retreat, we won't have lost much. Assuming that we retreat in good order. Of course. But the Bryarts have never shown hostility. And except for the spiders, I don't believe there's anything here that can catch us if we do have to run for it. Reroute. You may run, Skipper. But I intend to leave with dignity. Go straight on. And, incidentally, I've decided why the Bayats are so polite to hey, us. Let's find a new route. It's a little light for a new theory. Here it is Turn anyway. Left. They think we're Ramans. They Never can't mind. tell the difference I'll between one oxy eater and another. Re I don't believe they're that stupid. It's not a matter of stupidity. They've been programmed for their particular jobs, and we simply don't come into their when frame of reference. Make a U-turn. Perhaps you're right. We may find out as soon as we start work on London. Joe Calvert had always enjoyed those old bank robbery movies, but he had never expected to be involved in one. Yet this was, essentially, what he was doing now. The deserted streets of London seemed full of menace, though he knew that was only his guilty conscience. He did not really believe that the sealed and windowless structures ranged all around them were full of watchful inhabitants, waiting to emerge in angry hordes as soon as the invaders laid a hand on their property. Never mind. In fact, I'll find he was route. quite certain that this whole complex, Turn like left. all the other towns, was merely some kind of storage area. Right. But a second fear, also turn based right. on innumerable ancient crime dramas, could be better grounded. Though there might Get be ready. no clanging turn alarm right. bells and screaming sirens, it was reasonable to assume that Rama would have some kind of warning system. How otherwise did the Bayats know when and where their services were needed? Those without goggles, turn your backs, ordered Willard Myron. There was a smell of nitric oxides as the air itself started to burn in the beam of the laser torch, and a steady sizzling as the fiery knife sliced toward secrets that had been hidden since the birth of man. Nothing material could resist this concentration of power, and the cut proceeded smoothly at a rate of several meters a minute. In a remarkably short time, a section large enough to admit a man had been sliced out. Since the cutaway section showed no sign of moving, Myron tapped it gently, then harder, then banged on it with all his strength. It fell inward with a hollow, reverberating crash. Once again, as he had done during that first entrance into Rama, Norton remembered the archaeologist who had opened the old Egyptian tomb. He did not expect to see the glitter of gold. In fact, he had no preconceived ideas at all as he crawled through the opening, his flashlight held in front of him. A Greek temple made of glass. That was his first impression. The building was filled with row upon row of vertical, crystalline columns, about a meter wide and stretching from floor to ceiling. There were hundreds of them marching away into the darkness beyond the reach of his light. He walked toward the nearest column and directed his beam into its interior. Refracted as through a cylindrical lens, the light fanned out on the far side to be focused and refocused, getting fainter with each repetition 
in the array of pillars beyond. He felt that he was in the middle of some complicated demonstration in optics. Very pretty, said the practical Mercer. But what does it mean? Who needs a forest of glass pillars? Norton rapped gently on the column. It sounded solid, though more metallic than crystalline. He was completely baffled, and so he followed a piece of useful advice he had heard long ago. When in doubt, say nothing and move on. As he reached the next column, which looked exactly like the first, he heard an exclamation of surprise from Mercer. I could have sworn this pillar was empty. Now there's something inside it. Norton glanced quickly back. Where? he said. I oh, don't see anything. He followed the direction of Mercer's pointing finger. It was aimed at nothing. The column was completely transparent. You can't see it, said Mercer incredulously. Come around to this side. Damn! Now I've lost it. What's going on here? demanded Calvert. It was several minutes before he got even an approximation of an answer. The columns were not transparent from every angle or under all illuminations. As one walked around them, objects would suddenly flash into view, apparently embedded in their depths like flies in amber, and would then disappear again. There were dozens of them, all different. They looked absolutely real and solid, yet many seemed to occupy the identical volume of space. Holograms, said Calvert. Just like a museum on Earth. That was the obvious explanation, and therefore Norton viewed it with suspicion. His doubts grew as he examined the other columns and conjured up the images stored in their interiors. Hand tools, though for huge and peculiar hands. Containers, small machines with keyboards that appeared to have been made for more than five fingers. Scientific instruments, startlingly conventional domestic utensils, including knives and plates that, apart from their size, would not have attracted a second glance on any terrestrial table. They were all there, with hundreds of less identifiable objects, often jumbled up together in the same pillar. A museum, surely, would have some logical arrangement, some segregation of related items. This seems to be a completely random collection of hardware. They had photographed the elusive images inside a score of the crystal pillars when the sheer variety of items gave Norton a clue. Perhaps this was not a collection, but a catalog, indexed according to some arbitrary but perfectly logical system. He thought of the wild juxtapositions that any dictionary or alphabetized list will give, and tried the idea on his companions. I see what you mean, said Mercer. The Ramans might be equally surprised to find us putting, uh, camshafts next to cameras. Or books beside boots, added Calvert after several seconds of hard thinking. One could play this game for hours, he decided, with increasing degrees of impropriety. That's the idea, replied Norton. This may be an indexed catalog for 3D images, templates, solid blueprints, if you like to call them that. For what purpose? Well, you know the theory about the biots. The idea that they don't exist until they're needed, and then they're created, synthesized, from patterns stored somewhere. Keep left. I see, said Mercer, and he went on slowly and thoughtfully. So when a Raman needs a left-handed blivet, he punches out the correct code number and a copy is manufactured from the pattern in here. Something like that. But please, don't ask me about the practical details. Keep right. The pillars through which they had been moving had been steadily growing in size, 
and were now more than two meters in diameter. The images were correspondingly larger. Keep right. It was obvious that, for doubtless excellent reasons, the Ramans believed in sticking to a one-to-one -one scale. Norton wondered how they stored anything really big, if this was the case. To increase their rate of coverage, the four explorers had now spread out through the crystal columns and were taking photographs as quickly as they could get their cameras focused on the fleeting images. Keep this was an astonishing piece of luck, Norton told himself, though he felt that he had earned it. They could not possibly have made a better choice than this illustrated catalog of Raman artifacts. And yet, in another way, it could hardly have been more frustrating. There was nothing actually here except impalpable patterns of light and darkness. These apparently solid objects did not really exist. Even knowing this, more than once Norton felt an almost irresistible urge to laser his way into one of the pillars so that he could have something material to take back to Earth. It was the same impulse, he thought wryly, that would prompt a monkey to grab the reflection of a banana in a mirror. He was photographing what seemed to be some kind of optical device when Calvert's shout started him running through the pillars. Skipper? Carl? Will? Look at this! Calvert was prone to sudden enthusiasms, but what he had found now was enough to justify any amount of excitement. Inside one of the two-meter columns was an elaborate harness, or uniform, obviously made for a vertically standing creature much taller than a man. A very narrow central metal band apparently surrounded the waist, thorax, or some division unknown to terrestrial zoology. From this rose three slim columns, tapering outward and ending in a perfectly circular belt, an impressive hey, meter in diameter. Way. Loops equally spaced along it Keep could left, be intended only to go around upper limbs or arms. Three of on. them. There were numerous pouches, buckles, bandoliers right, from which tools right. or weapons protruded, pipes and electrical turn conductors, right. even small black boxes that would have looked perfectly at home in an electronics lab on Earth. Go straight on. The whole arrangement was almost as complex as a spacesuit, though it obviously provided only partial covering for the creature wearing it. And was that creature a Raman? Norton asked himself. Right. We'll probably never know, but it must have been intelligent because no mere animal could cope with all that sophisticated equipment. Turn right. About two and a half meters high, said Mercer thoughtfully, not counting the head, whatever that was like. With three arms and presumably three legs, the same plan as the spiders on a much more massive scale. Do you suppose that's a coincidence? Probably not. We design robots in our own image, we might expect the Ramans to do the same. Myron, unusually subdued, was looking at the display with something like awe. Do you suppose they know we're here? He half whispered. I doubt it, said Mercer. We've not even reached their threshold of consciousness, though the Hermians certainly had a good try. They were standing there, unable to drag themselves away when Rousseau called from the hub, his voice full of urgent concern. Skipper, you'd better get outside. What is it? Biots heading this way? No, something much more serious. The lights are going out. 43. Retreat. When he hastily emerged from the hole they had lasered, it seemed to Norton that the six sons of Rama were as brilliant as ever. Surely, he thought, Rousseau must have made a mistake, though that was not like him at all. 
But Rousseau had anticipated just this reaction. It happened so slowly, he explained apologetically, that it was a long time before I noticed any difference. But there's no doubt about it. I've taken a meter reading. The light level's down 40%. Now, as his eyes readjusted themselves after the gloom of the glass Finding temple, a new route. Norton could believe him. The long day of Rama was drawing to its close. It was as warm as ever, yet Norton felt himself shivering. He had known this sensation once before, right, during a beautiful right. summer day on Earth. There had been an inexplicable weakening of turn light, right. as if darkness was falling, or the sun had lost its strength, though there was not a cloud in the sky. Then he had remembered that a partial eclipse had begun. This is it, he said grimly. We're going home. Leave all the equipment behind. We won't need it again. Now, he hoped, one piece of planning was about to prove its worth. He had selected London for this raid because no other town was so close to a stairway. The foot of Beta was only four kilometers away. They set off at the steady, loping trot that was the most comfortable mode of traveling at half a gravity. Norton set a pace that he estimated, would get them to the edge of the plane without exhaustion and in the minimum of time. He was acutely aware of the eight kilometers they would still have to climb when they had reached Stairway Beta, but he would feel much safer when they had actually started the ascent. The first tremor came when they had almost reached the stairway. It was very slight, and instinctively Norton turned toward the south, expecting to see another display of fireworks around the horns. But Rama never seemed to repeat itself exactly. If there were any electrical discharges above those needle-sharp mountains, they were too faint to be seen. Bridge, he called. Did you notice that? Yes, Skipper. Very small shock. Could be another attitude change. We're watching the rate, Gyro. Nothing yet. Just a minute. Positive reading. Can just detect it. Less than a micro radian per second, but holding. So Rama was beginning to turn, though with almost imperceptible slowness. Those earlier shocks might have been a false alarm, but this, surely, was the real thing. Rate increasing. Five micro rad. Hello, did you feel that shock? We certainly did. Get all ship systems operational. We may have to leave in a hurry. Do you expect an orbit change already? We're still a long way from perihelion. I don't think Rama works by our textbooks. Nearly at beta. We'll rest there for five minutes. Five minutes was utterly inadequate, yet it seemed an age, for there was now no doubt that the light was failing, and failing fast. Though they were all equipped with flashlights, the thought of darkness here was now intolerable. They had grown so accustomed psychologically to the endless day that it was hard to remember the conditions under which they had first explored this world. They felt an overwhelming urge to escape, to get out into the light of the sun, a kilometer away on the other side of these cylindrical walls. Hub control, called Norton. Is the searchlight operating? We may need it in a hurry. Yes, Skipper. Here it comes. A reassuring spark of light started to shine eight kilometers above their heads. Even against the now fading day of Rama, it looked surprisingly feeble but it had served them before, and would guide them once again if they needed it. This, Norton was grimly aware, would be the longest and most nerve-wracking climb they had ever made. Whatever happened, it would be impossible to hurry. If they overexerted themselves, they would simply collapse somewhere on that vertiginous slope, 
and would have to wait until their protesting muscles permitted them to continue. By this time, they must be one of the fittest crews that had ever carried out a space mission, but there were limits to what flesh and blood could do. After an hour's steady plodding, they had reached the fourth section of the stairway, about three kilometers from the plane. From now on, it would be much easier. Gravity was already down to a third of Earth value. Although there had been minor shocks from time to time, no other unusual phenomena had occurred, and there was still plenty of light. They began to feel more optimistic, and even to wonder if they had left too soon. One thing was certain, however, there was no going back. They had all walked for the last time on the central plain of Rama. It was while they were taking a ten-minute rest on the fourth platform that Calvert exclaimed, What's that noise, Skipper? Noise? I don't hear anything. High-pitched whistle dropping in frequency? You must hear Go it. Go straight on. Your ears are younger than mine. Oh, now I do. The whistle seemed to come from everywhere. Soon it was loud, even piercing, and falling swiftly in pitch. Then it suddenly stopped. A few seconds later it came again, repeating the same sequence. It had all the mournful, compelling quality of a lighthouse siren sending out its warnings into the fog-shrouded night. There was a message here, and an urgent one. It was not designed for their ears, but they understood it. Then, as if to make doubly sure, it was reinforced by the lights themselves. They dimmed, almost to extinction, then started to flash. Brilliant beads, like ball lightning, raced along the six narrow valleys that had once illuminated this world. They moved from both poles toward the sea in a synchronized hypnotic rhythm that could have only one meaning. To the sea, the lights were calling. To the sea, and the summons was hard to resist. There was not a man who did not feel a compulsion to turn back and to seek oblivion in the waters of Rama. Hub control, Norton called urgently. Can you see what's happening? The voice of Rousseau came back to him. He sounded awed and more than a little frightened. Yes, Skipper. I'm looking across at the southern hemisphere. There are scores of biots over there, including some big ones. Cranes, bulldozers, lots of scavengers. And they're all rushing back to the sea faster than I've ever seen them move before. There goes a crane, right over the edge, just like Jimmy, but going down a lot quicker. It smashed to pieces when it hit. And here come the sharks. They're tearing into it. Ugh, oh, it's not a pleasant sight. Now I'm looking at the plane. There's a bulldozer that seems to have broken down. It's going round and round in circles. Now a couple of crabs are tearing into it, pulling it to pieces. Skipper, I think you'd better get back right away. Believe me, Norton said with deep feeling. We are coming just as quickly as we can. Rama was battening down the hatches, like a ship preparing for a storm. That was Norton's overwhelming impression, though he could not have put it on a logical basis. He no longer felt completely rational. Two compulsions were warring in his mind, the need to escape and the desire to obey those bolts of lightning that flashed across the sky, ordering him to join the Bayats in their march to the sea. One more section of stairway. Another ten-minute pause to let the fatigue poisons drain from his muscles. Then, on again. Another two kilometers to go, but better not to go think about up. that. The maddening sequence of descending whistles abruptly ceased. At the same moment, the fireballs racing along the slots of the straight valleys stopped their seaward strobing. Rama's six linear suns were once more 
continuous bands of light. But they were fading fast. And sometimes they flickered as if tremendous jolts of energy were being drained from waning power sources. From time to time there were slight tremors underfoot. The bridge reported that Rama was still swinging with imperceptible slowness, like a compass needle responding to a weak magnetic field. This was perhaps reassuring. It was when Rama stopped its swing that Norton would really begin to worry. All the Bayats had gone, so Rousseau reported. In the whole interior of Rama, the only movement was that of human beings crawling with painful slowness up the curving face of the North Dome. Norton had long since overcome the vertigo he had felt on that first ascent, but now a new fear was beginning to creep into his mind. They were so vulnerable here on this endless climb from plane to hub. Suppose that Rama, when it had completed its attitude change, started to accelerate. Presumably its thrust would be along the axis. If it was in the southward direction, Go that would be no on. problem. They would be held a little more firmly against the slope they were ascending. But if it was toward the north, they might be swept off into space to fall back eventually on the plane far below. He tried to reassure himself with the thought that any possible acceleration would be very feeble. Dr. Pereira's calculations had been most convincing. Rama could not possibly accelerate at more than a fiftieth of a gravity, or the cylindrical sea would climb the southern cliff and flood an entire continent. But Pereira had been in a comfortable study back on Earth not with kilometers of overhanging metal apparently about to crash down upon his head. And perhaps Rama was designed for periodic flooding. No, that was ridiculous. It was absurd to imagine that all these trillions of tons up. could suddenly start moving with sufficient acceleration to shake him loose. Nevertheless, for the remainder of the ascent, Norton never let himself get far from the security of the handrail. Lifetimes later, the stairway ended. Only a few hundred meters of vertical, recessed ladder were left. It was no longer necessary to climb this section, since one man at the hub, hauling on a cable, could easily hoist another against the rapidly diminishing gravity. Even at the bottom of the ladder, a man weighed less than five kilos, at the top, virtually zero. So Norton relaxed in the sling, grasping a rung from time to time to counter the feeble Coriolis force trying to push him off the ladder. He almost forgot his knotted muscles as he had his last view of Rama. It was about as bright now as the light of a full moon on earth. The overall scene was perfectly clear, but he could no longer make out the finer details. The South Pole was now partially obscured by a glowing mist. Only the peak of Bighorn protruded through it, a small black dot seen exactly head-on. The carefully mapped but still unknown continent beyond the sea was the same apparently random patchwork that it had always been. It was too foreshortened and too full of complex detail to reward visual examination, and Norton scanned it only briefly. He swept his gaze around the encircling band of the sea and noticed for the first time a regular pattern of disturbed water as if waves were breaking over reefs set at geometrically precise intervals. Rama's maneuvering was having some effect, but a slight one. He was sure that Sergeant Go Barnes would have sailed forth happily under these conditions had he asked her to cross the sea in her lost resolution. New York, 
London, Paris, Moscow, Rome. He said farewell to all the cities of the Northern Hemisphere and hoped the Ramans would forgive him for the damage he had done. Perhaps they would understand that it was all in the cause of science. Then, finally, he was at the hub, and eager hands reached out to Go grab him off. and to hurry him through the airlocks. His overstrained legs and arms were trembling so uncontrollably that he was almost unable to help himself, and he was content to be handled like a half-paralyzed invalid. The sky of Rama contracted above him as he descended into the central crater of the hub. When the door of the inner airlock shut off the view forever, he found himself thinking, how strange that night should be falling now that Rama is closest to the sun. 44. Space Drive a hundred kilometers was an adequate safety margin, Norton had decided. Rama was now a huge black rectangle, exactly broadside on, eclipsing the sun. He had used this opportunity to fly Endeavor completely into shadow, so that the load could be taken off the ship's cooling systems and some overdue maintenance could be carried out. Rama's protective cone of darkness might disappear at any moment, and he intended to make as much use of it as he could. Rama was still turning. It had now swung through almost 15 degrees, and it was impossible to believe that some major orbit change was not imminent. On the United Planets, excitement had reached a pitch of hysteria, but only a faint echo of this came to Endeavor. Physically and emotionally, her crew was exhausted. Apart from a skeleton watch, everyone had slept for 12 hours after takeoff from the North Pole base. On doctor's orders, Norton himself had used electrosedation. Even so, he had dreamed that he was climbing an infinite stairway. The second day back on the ship, Everything had almost returned to normal, and the exploration of Rama already seemed part of another life. Norton started to deal with the accumulated office work and to make plans for the future, but he refused the requests for interviews that had somehow managed to insinuate themselves into the survey and even Space Guard radio circuits. There were no messages from Mercury and the UP General Assembly had adjourned its session, though it was ready to meet again at an hour's notice. Norton was having his first good night's sleep, 30 hours after leaving Rama, when he was rudely shaken back to consciousness. He cursed groggily, opened a bleary eye at Carl Mercer, and then, like any good commander, was instantly wide awake. It stopped turning? Yes, steady as a rock. Let's go to the bridge. The whole ship was awake. Even the simps knew that something was afoot and made anxious, meeping noises until McAndrews reassured them with swift hand signals. As Norton slipped into his chair and fastened the restraints around his waist, he wondered if this might be yet another false alarm. Rama was now foreshortened into a stubby cylinder, and the searing rim of the sun had peaked over one edge. Norton jockeyed Endeavor gently back into the umbra of the artificial eclipse, and saw the pearly splendor of the corona reappear across a background of the brighter stars. There was one huge prominence, at least half a million kilometers high, that had climbed so far from the sun that its upper branches looked like a tree of crimson fire. So now we have to wait, Norton told himself. The important thing is not to get bored, 
to be ready to react at a moment's notice, to keep all the instruments aligned and recording, no matter how long it takes. This was strange. The star field was shifting, almost as if he had actuated the roll thrusters. But he had touched no controls, and if there had been any real movement, he would have sensed it at once. Skipper, said Calvert urgently from the nav position. We're rolling. Look at the stars. But I'm getting no instrument readings. Rate gyros operating? Perfectly normal. I can see the zero jitter. But we're rolling several degrees a second. That's impossible. Of course it is. But look for yourself. When all else failed, a man had to rely on eyeball instrumentation. Norton could not doubt that the star field was indeed slowly rotating. There went Sirius across the rim of the port. Either the universe, in a reversion to pre-Copernican cosmology, had suddenly decided to revolve around Endeavor, or the stars were standing still and the ship was turning. The second explanation seemed rather more likely, yet it involved apparently insoluble paradoxes. If the ship was really turning at this rate, he would have felt it, literally by the seat of his pants, as the old saying went. And the gyros could not all have failed, simultaneously and independently. Only one answer remained. Every atom of endeavor must be in the grip of some force and only a powerful gravitational field could produce this effect. At least, no other known field could. Suddenly, the stars vanished. The blazing disk of the sun had emerged from behind the shield of Rama, and its glare had driven them from the sky. Can you get a radar reading? What's the Doppler? Norton was fully prepared to find that this, too, was inoperative, but he was wrong. Rama was underway at last, accelerating at the modest rate of 0.015 gravities. Dr. Pereira, Norton thought, would be pleased. He had predicted a maximum of 0.02, and Endeavor was somehow caught in its wake like a piece of flotsam whirling round and round behind a speeding ship. Hour after hour, that acceleration held constant. Rama was falling away from Endeavor at steadily increasing speed. As the distance grew, the anomalous behavior of the ship slowly ceased. The normal laws of inertia started to operate again. They could only guess at the energies in whose backlash they had been briefly caught, and Norton was thankful that he had stationed Endeavor at a safe distance before Rama had switched on its drive. As to the nature of that drive, one thing was now certain, even though all else was mystery. There were no jets of gas, no beams of ions or plasma thrusting Rama into its new orbit. No one put it better than Sergeant Professor Myron when he said, in shocked disbelief. There goes Newton's third law. It was Newton's third law, however, upon which Endeavor had to depend the next day, when she used her very last reserves of propellant to bend her own orbit outward from the sun. The change was slight, but it would increase her perihelion distance by 10 million kilometers. That was the difference between running the ship's cooling system at 95% capacity and a certain fiery death. When they had completed their own maneuver, Rama was 200,000 kilometers away and difficult to see against the glare of the sun, but they could obtain accurate radar measurements of its orbit, and the more they observed, the more Keep puzzled right they became. And then exit right. They checked the figures over and over again until there was no escaping the unbelievable Exit. conclusion. Right. It looked as if all the fears of the Hermians, the heroism of Rodrigo, Turn and right. the rhetoric of the General Assembly 
had been utterly in vain. What a cosmic irony, thought Norton as he looked at his final figures. If after a million years of safe guidance, Rama's computers had made one trifling error, perhaps changing the sign of an equation from plus to minus. Everyone had been so certain that Rama would lose speed so that it could be captured by the sun's gravity and thus become a new planet of the solar system. It was doing just the opposite. It was gaining speed and in the worst possible direction. Rama was falling ever more swiftly into the sun. 45. Phoenix. As the details of its new orbit became more and more clearly defined, it was hard to see how Rama could possibly escape disaster. Only a handful of comets had ever passed as close to the sun. At perihelion, it would be less than half Keep a million right. kilometers above right. that inferno of fusing hydrogen. No solid material could withstand the temperature of such an approach. The tough alloy that composed Rama's hull would start to melt at ten times that distance. Endeavor had now passed its own perihelion to everyone's relief and was slowly increasing its distance from the sun. Rama was far ahead on its closer, swifter orbit and already appeared well inside the outermost fringes of the corona. The ship would have a grandstand view of the drama's final stage. Then, five million kilometers from the sun, and still accelerating, Rama started to spin its cocoon. Until now, it had been visible under the maximum power of Endeavour's telescopes as a tiny, bright bar. Suddenly, it began to scintillate like a star seen through horizon mists. It almost seemed as if it was disintegrating. When he saw the image breaking up, right. Norton felt a poignant sense of grief at the loss of so much wonder. Then he realized that Rama was still there, but that it was surrounded by a shimmering haze. And then it was gone. In its place, was a brilliant star-like object showing no visible disk, as if Rama had contracted into a tiny ball. It was some time before they figured out what had happened. Rama had indeed disappeared. It was now surrounded by a perfectly reflecting sphere about a hundred kilometers in diameter. All that they could now see was the reflection of the sun itself on the curved portion that was closest to them. Behind this protective bubble, Rama was presumably safe from the solar inferno. As the hours passed, the bubble changed Keep its left. shape. The image of the sun became elongated, distorted. The sphere was turning into an ellipsoid, its long axis pointed in the direction of Rama's flight. It was then that the first anomalous reports started coming in from the robot observatories, which, for almost 200 years, had been keeping a permanent watch on the sun. Something was happening to the solar magnetic field in the region around Rama. The million-kilometer-long lines of force that threaded the corona and drove its wisps of fiercely ionized gas at speeds that sometimes defied even the crushing gravity of the sun, were shaping themselves around that glittering ellipsoid. Nothing was yet visible to the eye, but the orbiting instruments reported every change in magnetic flux and ultraviolet radiation. And presently, even the eye could see the changes in the corona a faintly glowing tube or tunnel a hundred thousand kilometers long had appeared high in the outer atmosphere of the sun it was slightly curved bending along the orbit Rama was tracing and Rama itself 
or the protective cocoon around it was visible as a glittering bead racing faster and faster down that ghostly tube through the corona. For it was still gaining speed. Now it was moving at more than 2,000 kilometers a second, and there was no question of its ever remaining a captive of the sun. Now, at last, the Raman's strategy was obvious. They had come so close to the sun merely to tap its energy at the source and to speed themselves even faster on the way to their ultimate unknown goal. Soon it seemed that they were tapping more than energy. No one could ever be certain of this because the nearest observing instruments were 30 million kilometers away, but there were definite indications that matter was flowing from the sun into Rama itself, as if it was replacing the leakage and losses of 10,000 centuries in space. Faster and faster Rama swept around the sun, moving more swiftly than any object that had ever traveled through the solar system. In less than two hours, its direction of motion had swung through more than 90 degrees, and it had given a final, almost contemptuous proof of its total lack of interest in all the worlds whose peace of mind it had so rudely disturbed. It was dropping out of the ecliptic, down into the southern sky, far below the plane in which all the planets move, though that surely could not be its ultimate goal. It was aimed squarely at the greater Magellanic cloud and the lonely gulfs beyond the Milky Way. 46. Interlude. Come in, said Commander Norton absent-mindedly at the quiet knock on his door. Some news for you, Bill. I wanted to give it first before the crew gets into the act. And anyway, it's my department. Norton still seemed far away. He was lying with his hands clasped under his head, eyes half shut, cabin light low, not really drowsing, but lost in some reverie or private dream. He blinked once or twice and was suddenly back in his body. Sorry, Laura, I don't understand. What's it all about? Don't say you've forgotten. Stop teasing, you wretched woman. I've had a few things on my mind recently. Surgeon Commander Ernst slid a captive chair across in its slots and sat down beside him. Though interplanetary crises come and go, the wheels of Martian bureaucracy grind steadily away. But I suppose Rama helped. Good thing you didn't have to get permission from the Hermians as well. Light was dawning. Oh, Port Lowell has issued the permit. Better than that, it's already being acted on. Laura glanced at the slip of paper in her hand. Immediate, she read. Probably right now your new son is being conceived. Congratulations. Thank you. I hope he hasn't minded the wait. Like every astronaut... Norton had been sterilized when he entered the service. For a man who would spend years in space, radiation-induced mutation was not a risk. It was a certainty. The spermatozoan that had just delivered its cargo of genes on Mars, 200 million kilometers away, had been frozen for 30 years, awaiting its moment of destiny. Norton wondered if he would be home in time for the birth he had earned rest, relaxation, and such normal family life as an astronaut could ever know. Now that the mission was essentially over, he was beginning to unwind and to think once more about his own future and that of both his families. Yes, it would be good to be home for a while and to make up for lost time Keep right in many and ways. Then exit right. This visit, protested Laura rather feebly, was purely in a professional capacity. Right. 
After all these years, replied Norton, we know each other better than that. Anyway, you're off duty now. This situation, he knew, was doubtless being repeated throughout the ship. Even though they were weeks from home, the end of mission, orbital orgy, would be in full swing. Now what are you thinking? Demanded Laura, much later. You're not becoming sentimental, I hope. Not about us, about Rama. I'm beginning to miss it. Get ready to Thanks turn left. Thanks very much for the compliment. Turn left. Norton tightened his arms around her. One of the nicest things about weightlessness, he often thought, was that you could really hold someone all night without cutting off the circulation. There were those who claimed that love at 1G was so ponderous that they could no longer enjoy it. It's a well-known fact, Laura, that men, unlike women, have two-track minds. Get ready to But turn seriously, up. well, more seriously, I do feel a sense of loss. I can understand that. Don't turn be so up. clinical. That's not the only reason. Oh, never mind. You have arrived He gave at the destination. up. Your it was not easy to explain, even to himself. He had succeeded on this mission beyond all reasonable expectation. What his men had discovered in Rama would keep scientists busy for decades. And, above all, he had done it without a single casualty. But he had also failed. One might speculate endlessly, but the nature and the purpose of the Ramans was still utterly unknown. They had used the solar system as a refueling stop, a booster station, call it what you will, and had then spurned it completely on their way to more important business. They would probably never even know that the human race existed. Such monumental indifference was worse than any deliberate insult. When Norton had glimpsed Rama for the last time, a tiny star hurtling outward beyond Venus, he knew that part of his life was over. He was just fifty-five, but he felt he had left his youth down there on the curving central plane, among mysteries and wonders now receding inexorably beyond the reach of man. Whatever honors and achievements the future brought him, for the rest of his life he would be haunted by a sense of anticlimax and the knowledge of opportunities missed. So he told himself, but even then, he should have known better. And on far off earth, Dr. Carlyle Pereira had as yet told no one of how he had wakened from a restless sleep with the message from his subconscious echoing in his brain. The Ramans do everything in threes. This has been an Audible Frontiers production. Executive producer Steve Feldberg. Supervising producer Mike Charzik. Producer Gail Hendricks. Directed and engineered by Keith Reynolds. Music by Michael Whalen. Copyright 1973 by Arthur C. Clarke. Audio recording copyright 2008 by Audible Inc.